Okay, we're now we're at the Museum of Developer Art, and I'm standing here with Alex, who actually curated the pieces we're about to take a look at. Alex, can you tell me a little bit about why you chose these pieces for a developer festival? So the two artists that are here, uh, Ezra Miller and Vincent Jose, are both uh, developers themselves and artists. And so their work is really about using code uh, to create beautiful uh, natural simulations. Uh, Vincent creates uh, fluid dynamics that are interactive, which is a very hard thing to do. And uh, Ezra creates uh, data viz, uh, 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 sorry, data visualizations that are essentially transforming into flocking starlings. And why these pieces at this festival? So um, I wanted to find uh, artists that could understand the sort of developer mentality and communicate to developers and show that by using developer tools, you can still create really beautiful work. So that's, that's really the main reason. Awesome. Well, we were looking at them earlier, and that really comes through. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm standing here with Vincent in front of his art. Now, I have a few questions. It's amazing, and I really need to know more. But first, can you tell me just a little bit about this piece, uh, your process making it, what you used, and what it represents to you? So this piece is called um, Fluid Structure. It's an exploration of how a liquid-like shape form kind of deforms and react under various like forces and stimuli. So I've been fascinated for a long time by uh, fluid dynamics because it's it's like you see it everywhere in, in nature, mm -hmm. like stream, rivers, smoke, volcanoes, and it's all this like incredible variety of, of motion, very intricate. And <clears throat> historically it's been very um, Competition, computationally expensive, but now recent progress makes it possible to uh, do the simulation real time, and that makes it very exciting for me to be a like interactive piece using this technology, also to like explore like all kind of different uh, how it's going to react like playing with different forces and what happens if we slow the time down or make it really fast. And I think it's, uh, it seems familiar and, and both mysterious because we're kind of used to how things react to physics laws. So I think one of, one of the challenge for this piece was to was the scale and making it interactive for like a large number of people. Um, so it's using five different Kinex, which is a, a depth sensor that can tell me in space where the people are. And it's like computing like forces based on where people stand to like push the, the liquid around. So that most people who are like not always familiar with like sensors and like interactive installation would, would get it. Mm -hmm. There's little hints like you're gonna see your silhouette and like some modes where the the water falls on you is is easier to like get your interaction and how you yeah. mo in, influence the the result. And I think and w watching the people tonight, so it, it was a premiere for me as well to like, I, I tested with like a few friends, but it's like, what are people gonna do and like how they're gonna react? And, and a lot of people like are really getting into it and that's like pretty amazing to, to see that. Okay, so one more thing is that the size of this is massive. Now, I don't know what your studio space looks like, but I presume you did some prototyping that wasn't this big before. Like how did you kind of conceptualize a piece this large? So I, I was lucky I could prototype like, uh, like a smaller slice. Okay. And then um, I used like VR and, and Oculus to kind of like really? get a feel for the, the scale of the piece, which I had done in the past for other art installations, which were also pretty big scale. Um, and I'm based in New York, and so large space is, hard, is kind of like a rare thing to get. Yeah. So, so VR for me, it's like it's really useful to get a sense of scale. And the, the other thing is that since everything is running real time, I have like a number of parameters I can adjust quickly once I see the piece for the first time on site at scale, which I did tonight. So I slowed down something and like tweak some timings oh, cool. to, to make it like better. So that's the two, the two way I, I worked on the scale. Awesome, well thank you so much for sharing your art with us. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks. It's it's great to, to be here and like have this opportunity and 
thanks to uh, Alex for uh, curating this, uh, this medium of uh, developer art. Thank you. Okay, now we're looking at the second piece, and this one is by Ezra. Ezra, could you tell us a little bit about this? Um, yeah, so what we have here is my piece Data Murmuration, uh, which I built using WebGL. Um, so it's just running in the browser. Um, and it's a flocking simulation as well as a data visualization. So one of the things that I noticed about the piece is that you definitely have something to say about the really clear data that shows up every once in a while on this graph, but then it breaks out all these data points into this flocking behavior. Like, What brought you to that artistic choice? Right, so yeah, it oscillates between this sort of like formless cloud of birds swarming um, and then this really well-defined graph. Um, I think to me it's sort of trying to get at questions about whether humanity can organize itself um, as we face a lot of problems as a society. Um, and I think the, like, the difference between this like formless swirling cloud and that, get, get at that idea, I don't know. <laughs> All right, man. <laughs> hey, uh, let's talk a little bit more about the tech since we're at the yeah. developer conference. You said this is in the browser? Yeah, so I make websites using um, WebGL. This was built with 3JS, which is a pretty, like the go-to um, WebGL library, and I use it out in all of my work pretty much. Um, and it's built using shaders, um, which are programs that run on a computer's GPU um, that let you do computations a lot faster than on the CPU. And it's basically creating everything procedurally, um, which means there's no real image textures being used um, or any other real assets. Other, the, I think the main asset is the data, uh, and then everything sort of comes from that. So. And uh, I also noticed in addition to the flocking, there's this almost waterfall effect. What is that? Right. Um, I actually added that in like right recently uh, before we set up. Um, I think it just adds a little more dynamism to the to the background, uh, kind of cuts through the clouds and um, it, it's a feedback loop process, which uh, is something I use in all of my work pretty much. Um, yeah, I just thought we'll it looked... Leave it at that, it, yeah. I like that. <laughs> All right, Ezra, thank you so much for sharing your work with us today. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it. Wow. <laughs> All right, so I'm here at the VR drive-in, and I'm standing with Sarah, who actually helped uh, build the experiences that attendees are going through right now. Can you tell me a little bit about what they're experiencing? Yeah, so we're Google Spotlight Stories, and we are creating uh, content that directors create their own stories in this medium. So we have Pearl by Patrick Osborne, which was nominated for an Academy Award this year uh, for Best Animated Short Film. And we have the Gorillaz uh, newest music video, which is a first music video for our group. Now, you worked with the production teams and the artists in building these experiences, right? Yes, yes. What's that like? Do they have all sorts of questions? Like, what's different from a normal production experience? Yeah, it's uh, definitely a new medium for most people, but um, both took it to took to it very well. So it's you have to think about creating a film in 360 space a little bit differently than you would a normal 2D narrative film. So you have to make it interesting in all directions, if you will. Very cool, Sarah. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you.
largest foosball table I have ever seen. Look at this thing! <laughs> Coming to you live from the World Championships of Pair Ping Pong here at Google I.O. I'm just kidding, we're having fun. Alright, there's probably something I could say, but honestly, this is just mini golf. So I'm gonna go have some fun. What am I doing here? <laughs> Alright, so it's a 360 video booth that records high frame slow motion. So anything that you do looks cool, it's gonna be, and you get to share it right away. Does that sound good? Yeah. Alright, so the main rule is you don't leave the platform until I catch the arm so you don't get hurt. Okay. Other than that, you can do anything that you want. You can jump, move. You can, moving quick is cool, standing perfectly still is cool. Either way. But don't catch, move slow. Yeah, because it'll be kind of. Melodramatic. So like a jump or something? Be very, yeah. Oh, yeah. That'd be good. Yeah. You good to go? Yeah. Alright, I'm just testing it out. I don't really know what's going on, but I'm going to go with this. tuckered out. <laughs> Thanks for joining me at the block party here on the first evening of Google I.O. We saw a lot of really cool stuff and I hope you had as much fun as I did. All right. How's it going? Good morning. All right. Today, I want to share with you some of the stuff that we've been do doing on the Chrome DevTools team in the past year. Now, to, to speak a moment for the Chrome DevTools team, we've been, our mission is really to deliver you the tools 
to enable you to be productive. Um, <clears throat> can I get the speaker notes right over here on the left side? It's going to be great. It's even better. The good words. Um, we will do it. It's going to be good. I'll just dance until. All right, all right, all right. Are we good? Are we good? Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. All right, can we come back to this machine real, real quick? This guy right here. Love it. Love it. All right. So, <laughs> woo. thank you. Today, I want to share with you some of the good stuff we've been doing the last year on the Chrome DevTools team. And to speak for the team, we want to enable you and equip you with the tools to make you a productive developer. And that means powerful tooling to help you understand and improve your application. And we want that experience to be fun, too, and delightful. So today, we're going to cover a few things. Debugging your scripts, performance. We're going to look at auditing for excellence. We're also going to look at Node.js and Headless. A lot of good stuff in here. We're going to start off with debugging and some console kind of ergonomics. You know, the console is part of our core experience, right? It's, you spend a lot of time there, and so we uh, enjoy investing in these workflows. So these are a few of the things that we noticed that might need some sprucing up a little bit. So the console, right? I'm going to show you object previews and some new improved autocomplete. Uh, object previews, we're going to show a little bit of a little video. Uh, this is an object. We're just opening it up. We're exploring it. Uh, this is a bunch of network requests, so it's an array of objects. Um, and to hunt around and find that like one object that I'm really looking for, it takes a bit of work, right? Same thing here. I'm just cl clicking around. We're just wondering, you know, maybe that we could provide this a little bit more proactively. And so we're going to switch over to what it looks like now. Take this object, open it up. Now when you click on open it, so we get the previews of all the child objects immediately. So just instantly browse. You see all the sub-properties. And you got, you're in a good state of knowing immediately what's happening inside the data. All right. So that's object previews and just another view of that. On the left, we got what it was, well, last week, to be honest. But in today's Chrome Canary, you'll see something a little bit more like this. So an array of arrays, and now you get to see exactly what is in there without having to click in all the time. This is good stuff. All right. <clears throat> yeah, I like it. I like it. That's good. All right. Now I'm going to show you some autocomplete stuff. I'm going to come over here to my machine, take a little sip of water. And we're going to pop open to the console. All right. So we're here in the console, and I'll bring it in on about blank solid page. Now, you're at the console. You like to type things. And we want to make sure that it's very fast for you to get completions so that you are just able to do the work that you want to do. I'm going to look at document, uh, and we'll look at document.head. Um, and now I want to make sure that um, I want to look at the child nodes, OK? So I'm going to switch over to child nodes. Now at this point, like I've had these little auto completion as I type all these things in because we know exactly what document head is, right? But then we reach this point where we type in uh, zero, and we've done this kind of array access, right? Now, when we do zero, then all of a sudden, the completions, they used to just completely fail. So I'm just happy to report that now you hit period. We're like, no problem, array access. You got the completions, too. All right. Now, another one. Um, let's say that you have uh, an object. Object looks maybe like this guy. Um, so. The properties have dashes, and so you might know where I'm going with this. If I switch this over, if we take this and now we run this in the console, then classes dot. No, I can't because there's dashes, right? Not a problem. Square bracket notation, no big deal. 
And square brackets will just make sure that you have the key names right here, too. So, good stuff, but we can do a little bit better. You might be more on kind of the bleeding edge of things than the new side. So let's take this object here of classes, and we're going to make it a map, all right? So we'll do map equals new map, and we're going to use object.entries. I think this is uh, ES7 even. Uh, so object.entries, new map. We create a map of the exact same information. Now we do map.get, open up the paren, and there are our keys too. So making sure that you have all of your data right at your fingertips. All right. Now, while we're in the console, sometimes we spend a little bit more time uh, typing something out than we actually thought. We create not just a one-liner, and we're like, OK, well, there's some work to do. So we'll type out this function. Um, and I call it a log. And we'll just say args, and we'll open up our bracket. Now at this point, you're like, OK, well, I want to do a function. Do I hit Shift Enter so that it doesn't evaluate? I don't want it to err. Don't worry about it anymore. Just hit Enter. We know that you're not done. It's good. We're just going to give you a new line. We're going to indent. You're in a good place. Now type in console log. We'll do the args. We'll log that out. We hit Enter again. We know you're not done, but we close off that brace, and we're like, yeah, you're good. We'll fix the indentation. You hit Enter once more. Evaluate it. All right. That's good. So now we have a nice multi-line console that's aware of what's happening and is not going to uh, evaluate something that's obviously incorrect. Now, this console, too, has some upgrades. Syntax highlighting, uh, this was not here a year ago. Also, other text editor features. For instance, I'm going to hit Command D. I can do multiple selections and easily just change whatever I need right there inside the console. All right. So this is some of the cool stuff in the console. Thank you, thank you. Um, and now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about asynchronous JavaScript, right? So do you guys write a lot of asynchronous JavaScript? Hands? Yeah, OK, me too. Do you guys use promises? Yes, promises. All the time. I mean, because what, what would it be like if we didn't have them? It's, it's nice. But on the other hand, like debugging promises, ugh, not, not as much fun, really, is it? So I want to talk a little bit about async debugging. I'm going to show it with a little trio of examples. So we're going to come back over here. And I like the About Blank page. This is good. And I'm going to look at these snippets. OK. So here we got this snippet here. Uh, zoom out just a tad. Right. So this snippet, we start out with a job. A job runs. We call a process. In the process, we log out a little bit. We get some data. We print that. It's just logs. We finish up. And I got a debugger statement here so that I break, right? Synchronous execution flow, we're good. I'm going to run this. Uh, this is a snippet, so I can just uh, click this button or hit Command Enter, and we're good. Well, we do have a reference error, so we're not perfectly good. But if I just put that in there, then I think we're good. <laughs> OK. It was just a necessary adjustment. That's all. No big deal. All right, now I'm paused here. Synchronous, right? So we look over the call stack. Um, OK, call stack. We start off at anonymous, at the, inst at the instantiation of this job function. And the uh, process gets called. We go in, we call finish, and we end up there. This should be straightforward, right? We're good? We're good. All right, now that we have that out of the way, we're going to take, a little, take it up a notch. So we're going to go from synchronous to async, but we're going to use async await, right? So just some small changes. So now we're going to call job. But we've also introduced a little sleep function, just you know, delay a little, a few milliseconds. So now inside of process, we'll log out, but we'll sleep. We'll go fetch um, a fav, fav icon. We'll print out that result. We'll sleep a little bit more, and we'll finish, OK? Now let's try that out. I'll just run that, and we pause, and OK. Now the difference here is that we have 
same four uh, call frames in the stack, and they're pointing at the same location. But in the middle of this, we have this asynchronous hop, because going from job over to this call point in finish, we had an asynchronous operation. Inside process, all of these are asynchronous. Sleep, print, uh, and sleep again, right? So this also works. It makes sense. But promises are how I think a few more of us these days are doing async work. So I'll switch over to that. Same basic approach, but with promises this time. Inside job, we do a resolve, and then we go into here. And inside process, we have a promise resolve, sleep, fetch, get the result, sleep, finish, right? So we run that. Call stack, again, four call frames here, but two asynchronous hops in there. Now, the important thing here is that we are able to show the history of why we got here. And now, admittedly, these are kind of toy examples. But in the real world, things get a bit more complex. So this is a slightly more real world stack. Um, this is just the immediate stack of five synchronous call frames. Um, and looks like something coming from jQuery. There's not a lot of context. But if we have a synchronous stacks enabled, and we have that feature behind this call stack, then it looks a little bit more like this, taller stack. But it gives us much more uh, context. So even down at the bottom, I actually see that this came from an event handler into submit handler and submit data. So I know even at the top, it doesn't really communicate much. I know why this actually happened. Right? This is increasingly the default look of stacks. In the browser, we have many short spurts of synchronous work held together by asynchronous operations. So like set timeout, request animation frame, uh, promises, async await, plenty of other APIs. And not even to mention like uh, React's new core algorithm fiber. This is designed to break up big chunks of work into small asynchronous well, chunks of work. The browser runtime is all about asynchrony. Um, just for a look at how this uh, is in reality, um, this is a view of all of the async operations happening over the course of mm, uh, a quarter of a second. And we're taking all the asynchronous operations and rendering them as little arrows. I mean, I don't expect you to like, get a lot out of this, but just suffice it to say, it's busy. There's a lot going on. But DevTools is able to track what is going on from one call frame, a synchronous hop over to the next. We think it's imperative for the tools to communicate why you arrived at a specific call frame. So to pull this off, we've had to do a lot of work under the hood. So we've instrumented all of the browser points where asynchrony emerges, the timers and the rafts and the promises. We worked closely with the V8 team, and we track all the dangling kind of asynchronous execution hooks, and so that we know fr from the entirety of the program execution way to the beginning, uh, back to the beginning of the page load. In order to pull this off and do this efficiently at scale, we, we needed to do some work because we were really driven to flip the switch on this feature, making it from something that was like an opt-in checkbox in the corner to something that everyone should just get for free all the time. So there's no reason to, to co collect you know, expensive snapshots from the VM, replay execution, or like switching out into another tool. So what this really means is that stopping at any point of your program execution shows you the complete asynchronous history of how you got there. It's right there at your fingertips. But OK, sounds cool. What does this actually enable? I'm going to show you. So I have three new features I'm going to show to you. Uh, continue to point, inline breakpoints, and step into async. Well, to do that, we're going to come back to these same demos. And all right, the synchronous one. Place a little breakpoint here on line eight. And we're just going to start the execution. We pause. I'm going to hit step over 
because I'll just want to work my way down, result, print the result. OK, at this point, I can inspect the result. OK, great. Perfect. This is a common debugging scenario. But let's bring it over to the asynchronous world. So here, I'll place the breakpoint. I'll run pause. Now I'll step over. And I can just step over. And this time, all of this work is asynchronous, but we're still able to use the nice convenience of step over. We've made that asynchronous uh, debugging experience feel just like it was synchronous. <clears throat> now, uh, step over, so it works great with sync code and with await async. But uh, we often do this a lot of times. Either you're stepping over, or you'll be like, you know what? You know, I'm here on this log, here on this line, and I want to jump down to this. I'll just set a breakpoint right now. I'll play execution. You know, but it happens a lot. So we wanted to make sure that there was a bit more of a convenient shortcut for this. So that's continue to point. So now, if you're paused, you hold down the command key or the control key, and we're going to highlight in blue a few destinations inside this function that are available for you to just jump to. So when you click on one of these destinations, we're going to allow the execution to go forward, and then we're going to pause you right there. So I'll do that. I'll just uh, click on this print, and we just let the execution go forward. Now I'm paused here, and of course, I can just inspect this response. It's just a little bit of a convenience. Cool, thanks. Now, promises. <laughs> OK. Uh, I'll pause here and step over and step over again. Uh, what do you think? I mean, how do you feel about me stepping over at this point? It's like, yeah, like, what happens? I don't know. What, what does? Yeah, we just jump like right to the end. We are now exiting with a return value of a promise. None of this work has even happened yet. And it's just like, eh? Huh? I don't know. So we don't have the power of async await and the nice convenience to step over. That's not going to work for us. Uh, but we want to have this power. So uh, we actually thought about this and figured maybe there's another way that we can do this. And that led us to inline breakpoints. So now, because uh, what I really want is I really just want to pause like, like here, you know? I want to see what this result is. So I want to pause here. So I'm just going to put my breakpoint uh, on 14. We're going to highlight a few areas in that line where we can actually pause. And so, you know what? That spot right there, I'll turn that on and flip that one off. And now, when I go forward, I start off there, and I continue execution. And now I pause inside of that function, and now I can inspect the result like I want, which is good. <laughs> and that works. But to be honest, if you're using promises as much as I am, like, you will be doing this all the time. So again, we're like, we could make a little more of a convenience uh, function. We want to be able to, to pull this off with a single gesture. So I'll break. And now this time I'll hold down Control uh, or Command again. Now there's the blue destinations, but there's also these green destinations. The green means I'm going to step into this asynchronous function. So this time I'm going to step into this result, print result. And now I am paused inside of this asynchronous function, and I can inspect the result just like that. So a single gesture, and we're handling the step into async. <clears throat> All right, guys. So there's a lot of stuff in the asynchronous debugging, and we're really excited about it. I know that was a lot. We're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about performance, OK? Now, when we talk to our users and we ask questions like, all right, when you guys work on performance, what sort of panels do you use? So I don't, uh, what do you guys use? Do you use uh, the uh, profiles panel, oh, yeah. the timeline panel? Yeah, good. The network panel? Yeah. Obviously, there's a few things. And admittedly, the tools are a little distributed. 
But we're talking about browser performance here, where the completion of a JavaScript file downloading immediately leads to main thread work. And it's critical to see that connection. And when the JavaScript finishes executing, the browser takes a moment to calculate the layout, and then it sends off you know, pixels to the screen. This pipeline is very integrated, so we, knew, so we knew we needed a single integrated tool to visualize the entire picture. So that's led us to the performance panel. All right, so I'm going to show you a little bit of the performance panel in action. To do that, come back to my browser, clear those out. And we're just going to look at the home page of Nest just for fun. Bring open the DevTools. Now, this is the performance panel. Uh, we have screenshots enabled. That seems good. And you know what? I just want to capture a profile of the reload of the page, just the load. So I'll hit that one button. And what we're just going to do is capture the entire thing, and we'll stop it automatically when the page is done loading. All right. So we have some stuff on the screen, sure. Up in the top is a little overview and a film strip. And I can just kind of drag my mouse along and see screenshots of the page as it loaded. Go from just the very top bar to a little bit more, these images, the text. But like I said, we want to see kind of how this worked. So I'll just zoom in on, uh, well, everything up to, yeah, where things are looking good. And of course, the page load starts with some network uh, uh, requests. So I'm going to open up network. I'm going to zoom in. This is our HTML, some JavaScript, some style sheets, and so on. All right. This JavaScript catches my eye, right? Nest uh, web component bundle min JS. So the network connection goes out, waiting for the bytes, and then it starts downloading right here. So it's downloading, downloading, downloading. All right. What happens when this file stops downloading? Well, it stops downloading like right here. The main thread gets it right here. And then look at this. Main thread, evaluate script web components bundle. Yeah, that, that makes sense. OK, so there's a nice connection between the network and the main thread. So we see that work there. And we're just going to look to the right. OK, we parse some HTML. Some other things happen. Soon enough, uh, the browser calculates what it's, it's going to look like. They recalculate style, the layout, uh, the paint. So I imagine somewhere around here, it's actually going to ship these pixels to the screen. So now you can open up the frames track. And in the frames track, we have just the screenshots of what was happening in the page just positioned exactly where it actually happened. So now I can see, well, this was when, yeah, we got the top bar with the little Nest logo at the top. OK. That's something. I, I expected more, to be honest. Um, we'll just scroll to the right a little bit. OK, yeah, 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 there we go. So now we got these images and then the text. OK. The fact that the text took a little bit more time it leads me to an idea. I bet, I bet that we're dealing with web fonts here, and we were waiting for the web fonts to download. I close up, uh, well, open up network and zoom out a little bit. And I bet you that the web fonts just finished downloading. So if I zoom out and scroll over here, well, yeah. Uh, I spot them here. We have at least, at least the WAF files of light and regular. And these had just completed. And once they completed, then the browser had a chance to recalculate the style, which it needs to do, and layout. And then we were able to ship that frame. So we have this nice integrated view from the be beginnings of network requests to pixels on the screen. Now, some of you who might have been using the Profiles panel to do JavaScript development, I just want to orient you with what we have available here. So if I collapse again the network, on the main thread, we're dealing with just over time what is happening. But oftentimes, you're looking for what consumed the most time at an aggregate view, right? So we'll zoom out and open up the bottom and the bottom-up view. The bottom-up view is just a summary of everything that took time sorted by its own self-time. So here we can see, well, uh, there was some JavaScript on the page that took a little bit of time. The function e, yeah, not so. He was a little slow, I guess. And r, also not so fast. So you know, e and r, watch yourself. 
But the other important thing is that you see this in context. The browser was doing a bunch of other work, right? It was compiling scripts and laying things out and recalculating style. And now you get to understand that, you know, maybe E isn't so bad after all. Maybe I need to make sure that uh, I need to recalculate style a little bit less or lay things out less and make those take less time. Pro tip, fewer DOM elements will help this one. Anyways, that was a good quick look at the performance panel. And we hope you dig it. Now, uh, did that. The fastest code in the browser, we're talking about profilers, right? The fastest code is the code that never even runs. And better yet, the fastest code is the code that isn't even downloaded. So we're thinking about that and wondering what if we could provide you with a better view of what is actually being used in the page. And that's led us to the coverage profiler. I'm going to give you a short video of how this works. All right. So this is a little progressive web app that I made. And we're going to scroll down to the bottom, open up inside the drawers menu, the coverage panel. All right. At this point, we could just hit record and start collecting data. We're actually going to get instant data, especially from our CSS, because we know what's applying to the page right now. So here we actually see you know, all of the selectors and which selectors have already been matched the page. The ones that haven't are in red. Now, select uh, focus. There's no drop down that's been focused. Let's try it. Now we're going to click in and hit tab. And that, green, sorry, that red uh, rule went to green. So instant live updates here over in the coverage panel. Now, JavaScript is also available now. This is the JavaScript file. Uh, half of it is unused, which isn't great. We can like, look down, and if there's a get trips function. It's not executed. Feels like it should be. All right, well, we can just try it out. We're going to you know, select a schedule. We'll go from San Francisco down here to Mountain View. And boo, yeah, all right. Drop down the 50% uh, unused to just 10% unused, which is good. Yeah, you're making good use of all the bytes. So the coverage profiler gives you this sort of insight. Armed with this data, you can go to town. The red unused bytes, they are not your friend. They are not your user's friend either. Don't send users red bytes. Nobody likes that. Check it out, the coverage profiler. But then again, thanks, thanks. Then again, sometimes all the bytes that you're running on the page are you know, not necessarily yours. They're someone else's. They're third-party code. So when you see a, a big waterfall of a, 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 sorry, a network waterfall of a big site, you're like, a lot of stuff going on. Like, who is this? And this is you know, a challenge. You, you should know exactly what is happening on your site and who it is. So it's all about attribution. We've thought about this, and we have a new feature to show you. You can try this out in Chrome Canary now. And it's some third-party attribution. Now, the command palette is a great place to turn, turn this on. Command-Shift-P, type in uh, third-party, type in badges, flip this on. And once you have this on, you go over to something like the network panel. Now next to the network requests, we're going to throw a little badge next to it. So uh, next to the file name, we'll say something like DC. When you click on DC, we'll just be like, it's double click. And then you'll see a GA badge and be like, what is, who is it? Google Analytics. And we're doing this for a lot of different third-party code, ads, analytics, tracking, all sorts of stuff. This is available in other places too. So in the console, with, whether you have logs or errors, and you're like, who is this coming from? Like, VM script, I don't even know. That doesn't tell me much. We're going to tag it there, too, and put the little badges in. You can find out. Also, over in the timeline, you can take that bottom-up view, group it by product, and see, OK, it looks like these guys are spending a lot of time on my main thread. It's cool. Yeah, I know. <sighs> That's good. All right. So uh, come back here. Yeah, it's good. We got. A good amount of data in here. We're recognizing over 1,400 different projects, products, and that means over 5,000 domains uh, that we're keeping track of and showing. Uh, the data is just kind of 
uh, built in there, but we have a little link report mismatch. If anything looks fishy to you, click it, report it to us. We want to make sure that the data is super useful to you and as accurate as we can be. All right, that brings us to authoring. We've covered debugging, performance insights, but there's some other key actions in your workflow. Um, and we've added some features there. I think you're going to like them. Some good stuff. This one, cookie editing. You've been able to view cookies for a while, not been able to edit cookies. I know, I know, I know you were excited about this one. Yes, it's been a long time coming. We have cookie editing. We're good now. We're good. OK. Um, <clears throat> the next one. It's a good one. Um, change tracking. So often you get into this case, right? You're you know, editing the CSS. You're just tweaking something. Uh, you make a bunch of changes. You, at this point, like, you've got it to where you want it to look like. You kind of have lost track of all of the changes that you've made. So down in the drawer, you can open up the changes view. And we're going to summarize. We're going to give you a diff of all of the changes that you've made file by file. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, this is an experiment as of today, but we'll be turning it on in Canary by default. Oh, Monday? Monday. Let's do that. OK, good. Um, all right. Screenshots. Ooh, yeah. All right. Check this out. So we're looking at um, the Google Store, right? We want to take a screenshot of the page. Now we're going to use that command palette, right? Command Shift P, type in screenshot. Yep. And we can just capture the screenshot, capture the ping. We can open it up. Boom. Easy. All right. This is good. It's been there for a little bit, but I can do better. I can do better. We're going to open up the, uh, the device menu, and now we can do the same thing there. But what I like to do is I like to turn on the device frame, get that light, nice art around it. Then you capture a screenshot, and you got that good look. Looks good in presentations. Puppies and dogs are really impressed with that. Show them. They'll love it. Um, and then there's one more that I like even more, the full size screenshot. We're going to get the full page, capture it, and now single ping, full resolution. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm right there with you. I'm right there with you. All right. There's one more. I had to sneak this in. I like to call it breakpoint resolving. You know how sometimes you, uh, you put a breakpoint on a page, then you go change it around, and then all of a sudden, like, it's not on the line that you meant for it to be on, right? It's like, that's kind of a pain. So I'll do that here. I'll place this breakpoint, put it on, um, I put the breakpoint on construct select. Now I'm going in my editor, I'm moving things around, adding a log, I'm going to come back. You know, it's there, but when I refresh, it's in, a different, it's in the first run function. Different thing, it's not where I left it. I'm like, Nuh. All right. In the new, in now, uh, you'll see this in Canary, beta. You just refresh. We keep the position. We track where that was. And even if you change things around a little bit, we're going to make sure that the breakpoint stays on the same line. All right. Yeah, it's good. Not going to work all the time. If you completely change things, uh, we're going to lose track. But we're going to do our best. All right. Now, I wanted to share with you one of my favorite parts here. That's good. So about the past year and a half, personally, I've been working on uh, the Lighthouse project. And Lighthouse is great. It gives you a lot of insight into what's happening and the sorts of improvements that you can make, right? It's available as a Chrome extension, a uh, command line app, a node module, access it in a variety of ways. But we always knew that there was value in having it more deeply integrated, integrated into the development workflow. So I'm going to show you what this looks like with the DevTools integration. So we'll look at Chrome experiments as an example. Pop open the DevTools. And we're going to go over to the Audits panel. Audits panel, been refreshed a little bit. Uh, we'll go down. We'll run an audit. We're just going to do the full audit of everything. At this point, we're emulating uh, a Nexus 5X. We're throttling network. We're even throttling CPU to slow it down a little bit more like a phone. And we're looking at a lot of things. We're looking at the load performance and capturing a bunch of different metrics. Um, <clears throat> also looking at things like accessibility how much of a progressive web app it is, and all that. And then we get the report right here in the DevTools. And so a few things going on with this site. Progressive web app side, not so good for them, but you know, they're HTTPS, eh, some good stuff. 
in the performance section, a film strip and some of the high quality metrics you might have heard about, first meaningful paint, first interactive, and how those line up against the screenshots. And then other things like, you know, image optimization. We're giving you an idea of how much value you're going to get out of all those recommendations. So you don't have to guess and be like, yeah, it really wasn't that impactful. Now, I'll show, thank you, thank you. I'll show one more thing while I'm at it, though. Uh, Google, I just ran this on the Google homepage. And the accessibility results uh, were kind of interesting to me. So I opened that up. And because we're in DevTools, now when you hover over this node result, we're just going to highlight it up there. You can click through and just start inspecting it in the elements panel. So we'll do that again uh, with a color contrast. So now a few things. Looks like in the footer that don't hit the color contrast mark. And we see them highlighted. And we can see immediately the actual elements that we're talking about. So this nice integration between the deep insights of Lighthouse and the runtime of DevTools together brings a lot of power. I've saved a developer favorite till now. Headless browsers, you know, they enable you to create automated tools that can run in a variety of different settings. And people do a lot of things with this. Text extraction, screenshots, and performance testing, security testing, unit testing. I mean, everyone here, I'm, uh, who, who, maybe, raise your hand if you're using a headless browser of some sort in your workflow. Yes, of course. A lot of things. And we've seen this happening, and for the longest time, us on the Chrome team, we've been wanting to make, uh, provide a contribution to that scenario, to those workflows. And so today, we're happy to officially announce the availability of Chrome Headless. So Chrome Headless works great on all OSs, uh, Linux and Mac and Windows. It's working great in all these places. Windows, Chrome 60, a little bit newer. The other ones are in, in great shape. And so this enables quite a bit there's a lot to come. Selenium support, for instance, is right on the way. We're really excited about this. Now, right now, things are a little bit low level. There'll be higher level APIs coming soon. There's a big, flourishing developer community coming around Chromium Headless right now and its primary API, which is the DevTools protocol. So I encourage you, if you're curious about this, check it out. There's a great uh, blog post um, from Eric Beidelman about Chrome Headless, and it's going to get you started with how things work and all sorts of tools available right now. All right, last thing, Node.js. So who here develops with Node? Yeah, 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 me too. Um, there's a lot going on. Uh, last year, a year ago here, we announced that Node.js could be debugged and profiled with DevTools. Well, we announced a pull request that enabled it. The pull request is submitted. We're like, we'll announce that, because that's what we got. But soon enough, yes, the pull request got merged into Node.js, and it shipped. And so now we're in a great place. Because a lot of us developers, we spend time both in the browser and in Node. And we want to make sure that the experience in debugging Node is good. And so I'm going to show you some improvements to the workflow that we've made. And to contrast it to what debugging Node was like two years ago is good. It's so good. All right. Uh, I'll show you a little bit of stuff here. OK. Now, I'm actually just going to be, uh, this is how I debug Lighthouse when I'm working on it. Um, and I'll bring back open this browser, uh, this one. Yeah, great. Now, I'll do something like this, this command, right? Node. <clears throat> And I'm going to be running this script. But anyways, the important thing is inspect break. This allows, this says that I'm going to start inspection, and I want to put a breakpoint on the very beginning. OK? Otherwise, I'm just running Lighthouse. So the first thing I hit Enter, this URL pops out. Now, if you've done this before, you've seen this URL, and you're like, OK, well, I guess I'll copy and paste it. And you can. You certainly can. But there are better ways. So one better way is we can type in about inspect, and we see this panel. And the best one here that I recommend you clicking instead of this shiny looking guy is the dedicated DevTools for Node. Now, this window is going to be dedicated to just Node. And so you can see immediately we broke on the program execution. And I, again, have all of the power that I need. I can continue, step in, and just go crazy. So that's good, but we can do a little bit better. All right. 
Now, this time, I'm thinking it would be good if I didn't have to remember that URL about inspect every single time. And this functionality was available to me in a bit more of an immediate place where I spend a lot of my time. So uh, now I'm going to open up DevTools. And uh, when I run this uh, command again, I don't know if you spotted this, but right up next to the inspect element icon, there's a new one. A little green node icon. It snuck in there, right there. We detected that there's a debuggable node, and we're like, you know what? If you want to debug that, we got you right here. So you can just come over and click that. We're going to pop open that same dedicated DevTools uh, for node window. <laughs> the cool thing about this dedicated window, I love this, is, you know, OK, this works, and I'm debugging, and I do what I need. And they're like, OK, found a bug. And so now I'm going to need to you know, fix a bug. And da 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 da. You know, I'm changing things. I need to like, run it again. And so I'll run it again. But because we have that dedicated window, it's like, hey, I'm right here. I got you. I'll pop right back open. So it's always there and connecting. So even if you have to restart Node, you have that one single window. And that's going to take care of you the entire time. All right. So I'm going to have to stop that. There we go. OK. You guys have made it. We've covered a lot. We've covered a bunch of new features and dev tools from that great new uh, experience with object previews, the autocomplete in the console, all the asynchronous debugging goodies, uh, performance panel, coverage, third party attribution, Chrome headless, Node, all sorts of good stuff. Uh, if you like this kind of a thing, follow us on Twitter. Great docs, updated regularly. And if ever you have bugs, we definitely want to know. If you have feature requests, we also definitely want to know. Any feedback, just tell us about your workflow and the sorts of things that work for you. New.crbug.com is where you can find us, reach us, throw us a message. We'd love to hear from you. Anyways, that's it for me. Thank you guys very much. Appreciate it. app needs a database connected to a robust UI. The new components, Room, View Model, Live Data, and Lifecycle make that easy. They're also designed to fit together like building blocks. So let's see how. I'll use Room, which is a new SQL -like object mapping library. To set up the tables using Room, we can define a plain old Java object, or POJO. We then mark this POJO with the at entity annotation and create an ID marked with the at primary key annotation. Now for each POJO, you need to define a DAO or database access object. The annotated methods represent the SQL-like commands you need to interact with your POJO's data. Now take a look at this insert method and this query method. Room has automatically converted your POJO objects into the corresponding database tables and back again. Room also verifies your SQLite at compile time. So if you spell something a little bit wrong, or if you reference a column that's not actually in the database, it will throw a helpful error. Now that you have a Room database, you can use another new architecture component called Live Data to monitor changes in the database. Live Data is an observable data holder. That means it holds data and notifies you when the data changes so that you can update the UI. Live Data is an abstract class that you can extend. Or for simple cases, you can use the Mutable Live Data class. If you update the value of the Mutable Live Data with a call to set value, it can then trigger an update in your UI. What's even more powerful, though, is that Room is built to support live data. To use them together, you just modify your DAO to return objects that are wrapped with the live data class. Room will create a live data object observing the database. Then you can write code like this to update your UI. The end result is that if your Room database updates, it changes the data in your live data object, which automatically triggers UI updates. This brings me to another awesome feature of live data. 
Live data is a lifecycle aware component. Now you might be thinking, what exactly is a lifecycle aware component? Well, I'm glad you asked. Through the magic of lifecycle observation, live data knows when your activity is on screen, off screen, or destroyed so that it doesn't send database updates to a non-active UI. There are two interfaces for this, lifecycle owner and lifecycle observer. Lifecycle owners are objects with lifecycles, like activities and fragments. Lifecycle observers, on the other hand, observe lifecycle owners and are notified of lifecycle changes. Here's a quick peek at the simplified code for live data, which is also a lifecycle observer. The methods annotated with at on lifecycle event take care of initialization and teardown when the associated lifecycle owner starts and stops. This allows live data objects to take care of their own setup and teardown. So the UI components observe the live data and the live data components observe the lifecycle owners. As a side note to all you Android library designers out there, you can use this exact same lifecycle observation code to call setup and teardown functions automatically for your own libraries. Now you still have one more problem to solve. As your app is used, it will go through various configuration changes that destroy and rebuild the activity. We don't want to tie the initialization of live data to the activity lifecycle because that causes a lot of needlessly re-executed code. An example of this is your database query, which is executed every time you rotate the phone. So what do you do? Well, you put your live data and any other data associated with the UI in a view model instead. View models are objects that provide data for UI components and survive configuration changes. To create a view model object, you extend the view model class. You then put all of the necessary data for your activity UI into the view model. Since you've cached data for the UI inside of the view model, your app won't require the database if your activity is recreated due to a configuration change. Then when you're creating your activity or fragment, you can get a reference to the view model and use it. And that's it. The first time you get a view model, it's generated for your activity. When you request a view model again, your activity receives the original view model with the UI data cache. So there's no more useless database calls. To summarize all of this new architecture shininess, we've talked about Room, which is an object mapping library for SQLite, Live Data, which notifies you when its data changes so that you can update the UI, and importantly, it works well with Room so that you can easily update the UI when the database values change. We've also talked about lifecycle observers and owners, which allow non-UI objects to observe lifecycle events. And finally, we've talked about view models, which provide you data objects that survive configuration changes. Altogether, they make up a set of architecture components for writing modular, testable, and robust Android apps. You can sensibly use them together, or you can pick and choose what you need. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. In fact, a more fully fledged Android app might look like this. For an in-depth look at how everything works together and the reasoning behind these components, check out the links in the description below. To jump straight into code and get started working with these objects, you can check out the code labs and samples for lifecycle and persistence. Happy building, and as always, don't forget to subscribe. I'm Wojtek Kaliczynski, this is Android Tool Time, and let's talk a bit about the Espresso Test Recorder and how it can help with adding UI tests to your app. But first, a short explanation for those unfamiliar with Espresso. Espresso is a testing framework designed to provide a fluent API for writing concise and reliable UI tests. However, it is often the case that developers are reluctant to add UI tests to their apps or simply don't have time to learn the framework. This is where the Espresso Test Recorder comes in. It lets you create and add UI tests to an existing app in an interactive way. You may have previously seen the beta version of this feature, but in Android Studio 2.3, we are promoting it to stable with a few enhancements. To get started with the test recorder, click on Record Espresso Test under the Run menu. The Device Selection dialog pops up, and after you make your choice, the test recorder runs your app in debug mode. Simply progress through your app's UI as a regular user would by clicking buttons, swiping, and typing into input fields, and all those actions will appear in the test recorder window. You can also click here to add an assertion to your test at any time during recording, which will trigger the test recorder to dump the current view hierarchy. To select the view you want to assert on, Click on the screenshot that appears in the recording window and choose between the assertion type from view exists, doesn't exist, or check that it contains the specified text. When you've finished recording your test, the test recorder generates the equivalent test code to run your actions and assertions and puts it in a new file in your project's instrumentation test folder. It also checks if your build file contains the required Espresso dependencies 
and adds those if needed. When you look at the source file that Espresso Test Recorder created, you will see that it's perfectly normal, human-readable code. So if you need to further customize your tests or alter them when your app changes, you can simply open the file again and make the alterations you need. As you can see, the Espresso Test Recorder is very simple to use, but it does come with some limitations. As of Android Studio 2.3, only a few most common assertions are available through the Recorder UI. So if you need anything more complicated than that, you will need to edit the generated code by hand. Also, at this stage, the test recorder cannot handle all situations where additional synchronization is needed to deal with delays and async operations in your apps. I highly recommend getting familiar with the Espresso Idling Resource API and using that in your tests to signal when a long-running operation happens. For advanced users who want to tweak some aspects of test code generation, there's a settings page for the test recorder in Android Studio Preferences. Here, you can change the maximum view hierarchy depth that will be used for view identification and if app data should be cleared every time you record a new test. The Espresso Test Recorder is a great way to start adding tests to your app, whether you want to learn Espresso by examining the generated code or simply to quickly build a test suite which you can customize later. We look forward to your feedback on our social channels and happy testing. Hi, Timothy Jordan, your friendly developer advocate here at Google I.O. 2017. I'm in the machine learning area, and we're going to check out a lot of really cool stuff. A reminder before I get to it, if you'd like to see any of this footage or any of the other sandbox tours that I've been doing, go to g.co slash I.O. slash guide. First off, I'd like to check out the cloud TPU in person. Wow. So much heat sink. It's look like a skyscrapers. <laughs> it's like a miniature city down there. It's amazing. This is, this is seriously one of the best Tron moments I've had in years. This is among the amazing, most amazing things I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Okay, Magnus. Everybody, this is Magnus. You may know him from, well, being Magnus and all sorts of things. Hi, Magnus. Hi, how are you? I'm doing super well. So you've been hanging out with all this really cool machine learning stuff all day long. Yeah, that's right. We've been here all day doing different machine learning stuff. <laughs> I'd like to check out some of it and just play with it. Okay. Uh, let's try AI duets first. So what is this? So you can actually play on these things, and then the network um, generates something back. Yeah. OK. So it's kind of like the machine playing music with you. Yeah. It's kind of constructing music based on what you play. It's trying to create something similar, but still different. OK. I want to try it out. Fun. It feels a little like that scene in Close Encounters with the Third Kind. Yeah, absolutely. 
<laughs> All right, so there's uh, one other thing that I would like to check out while we're here, and that's the candy sorter. Yes, it's an amazing thing. It consists of so many different machine learning technologies in one single demo. Shall we check it out? Yeah, for sure. As promised, we're going to check out the candy sorter. What is a candy sorter, you may ask? Well, Dave's here to tell us what that is. Okay, great. So what we're going to show here is how you can infuse machine learning into your apps without actually being a data scientist. And what, the way we're going to do it is through candy and through labels. Now, we've, what we've done is we've gone through, we've trained a model um, up in the cloud that for, uh, for basically we've taken an existing model and we've trained it for candy. So we've put labels and next to candies. And we've got a little camera here that's taking pictures of the candy, and we put labels that have been associated with the candy. We sent it up to the Google Cloud Machine Learning Engine, and we've trained the model we're using the Inception V3 model and using transfer learning. And so what we're going to show now is now that the model's been trained is actually the serving of the model. So I'm going to take candy here and just throw it out in front of the camera. And this is just any random candy that We've, we have trained this model for. So I like, I like gum, I want to make sure there's plenty of gum out there. And you'll want to make sure there's a little bit of space in between here. Again, when we train this, this image, it has been, it has been a well-trained model that has been modified with these images and these labels. You can even write your own labels, which is awesome. So now it's trained. Now the fun part of this is actually the serving, the prediction. So you're going to speak into this mic. You're going to hit this little mic button here. You're going to speak into this mic and ask for some kind of candy. And it's going to make a call to our API. It's going to understand the text. It's going to do a speech API, so speech to text API. And then it's going to understand the intent of what you're asking for using our natural language processing API. And then it's going to make a prediction based upon the model that's sitting out in the cloud, and the best part is, hopefully, cross your fingers, it's going to give you, it's going to pick, make the prediction, pick it, and then give it to you. Awesome, okay. All right, so click on that and speak into the mic. May I have some gum? So it understood what you said, may I have some gum. Now it's going through natural language processing, it's identifying the noun, the noun there, and gum, so now it's trying to it will then match based upon the model that's been modified. Come on, come on, come on. And it is picking chewy gum. Oh, and there, the camera identified extra long-lasting watermelon gum. Now the camera's, uh, the, and, and over, and there's your gum. <laughs> that's great. Machine learning in an app. So I'm, uh, I get to keep this, right? Yeah, actually, I've got like seven boxes back there, so <laughs> please take everybody take one. Dave, thanks so much. All right, thank you. That was pretty great. All right, so that is the machine learning area. I hope that you've enjoyed these experiences as much as I had. It's really cool to see machine learning up close and personal, see how it can be used in real life through these demos. And I hope it inspires you to do some cool stuff with TensorFlow Cloud. See you later.
please welcome an amazing panel of AI experts, moderated by Diane Green. Hi, everybody. I, I'm Diane Green. I run Google's Phenomenal Cloud. I'm on the board of Alphabet. And I'm incredibly proud today to be here moderating this panel of just absolute leading experts, uh, leading researchers and experts in artificial intelligence and machine learning. We're going to structure our, our panel talking about past, present, and future, closing with some personal reflections on the industry and our careers. And uh, before I do that, I'm just going to quickly introduce everybody. Uh, first is Francoise Buffet. She's principal scientist at Google and, and is the, leading, the leader of speech recognition at Google, something everybody uses. Been at Google 12 years. Uh, second is Faith Lee. She's the chief scientist of Google Cloud, bringing AI and ML to companies all over the world. Also head of Stanford's AI Lab and inventor of ImageNet and the ImageNet Challenge, which really contributed to some of our developments in deep learning and AI. And she's also a champion of STEM and AI and the founder of AI for All. Uh, next, uh, Fernanda Viegas. She's a senior staff researcher at Google. She's a computational designer. Her, she, work, she focuses on the scientific and collaborative aspects of information visualization, co-leads the big picture data visualization group. She's part of Google Brain. And she's also known for her visualization-based artwork which is part of the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And then let me introduce Daphne Kohler, who today is Chief Computing Officer at Calico, Calico Labs, which is a part of Alphabet, working to give people longer and healthier lives. But she's also, uh, she, she uh, spent 18 years at Stanford. Uh, she led the AI group there. Uh, she co-founded Coursera, which is uh, the, leading, the largest platform for MOOCs, massively online uh, uh, courses, open online courses. And you know, Daphne was one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in 2012. She won a MacArthur Foundation Award. She was run the inaugural ACM Prize for Computing. Uh, she's a member of the Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Academy of Engineering, and those are just some of the proof points of her excellence. <laughs> So we'll start with a historical perspective. And Daphne, as one of the most prominent and prolific authors, authors of machine learning research papers, uh, can you give us your perspective on, on how we've transitioned to deep learning? So I think the deep learning revolution is a truly exciting um, enabler that we're seeing today in so many aspects of in so many real world problems. But that revolution came out of an outgrowth of a lot of machine learning research that led up to it. So prior to deep learning, there were probably about 10 or 15 years of very hard work in developing models that were maybe more handcrafted, that required a lot more thought and a lot more prior knowledge and where you really had to think through the specifics of the model um, and how it relates to the domain because when you don't have a lot of data you have to replace that with a lot of human intuition on how the model ought to be constructed. Um, as we've gotten more and more data in certain domains 
text and images being, I think, the two primary examples, and, and speech, of course, as well, uh, we've started to um, replace a lot of that need for human insight with, um, with more and more data that, uh, that, com that counterbalances that. But the techniques that were developed in those 10 or 15 years are still pivotal today, both in the methods themselves, those optimization algorithms that were developed over the last 10 or 15 years are still a key component of what enables deep learning to be successful. Um, and I think that while we might like to think that big data is at this point the solution to everything, it's a solution in certain domain areas, but in others, we still are unfortunately in the medium or sometimes even small data regime. And so there's still definitely a need for balancing human intuition with, um, about the domain with the data that we're acquiring and coming up with a model that incorporates the best of both. Thank you. And Fei-Fei, can we also get your perspective? You're running the Stanford AI lab. Um, your image network was seminal. And now you're, bringing, you're looking at how, bringing AI to every company in the world. What is going on with that transition? Right. Uh, thank you, Diane. So um, just a little bit of a historical perspective that AI in all sciences of human civilization is actually a very young field. We're about 60 years old. But the very question of the quest for intelligence, in my opinion, is what's at the root of, uh, of AI's inspiration. And that dates back since the beginning of uh, the dawn of civilization. So about 60 years ago, when machines start to compute and calculate at that time, very simple arithmetics. Already thinkers like Alan Turing challenged humanity with the question, can machines think? Can machines have intelligence? So about 60 years ago, uh, leading computer scientists like Marvin Minsky, John McCarthy, and many others get together, I really jump-started a field that today we know as AI. The AI that the founding fathers saw was very different technically 60 years ago, but it was the same core dreams, which is making machines to learn, to reason, to think, to s perceive, to speak, to communicate. And um, AI has gone through several waves of technical development, from first order logic, to expert systems, to the early waves of machine learning, to today the, the deep learning revolution. I would say the past 60 years, I call it the in vitro AI or AI in vitro. It's the 60 years there as a field, we laid the foundation of the questions we ask, the subfields that are essential to AI's quest, like robotics, computer vision, um, natural language processing, speech processing, combio, and, and so on but also the way we measure the progress to understand our data and, and discover the tool sets. So around 2010, around that time, thanks to the convergence of the maturing of statistical machine learning tools, the convergence of big data brought to us by the internet and by the sensors, and the convergence of computing, the Moore's law carried us to much better hardware. These three pillars came together and lifted AI from the in vitro stage into what I call the in vivo stage. <laughs> AI in vivo is where AI is making a real impact to the world. It's just the beginning. Every single industry that at cloud, at Google, we, we see it's going through a transformation because of data, because of uh, AI and machine learning. And, um, and this is what I see as the historical moment that AI is, is going to impact and, and transform the field. But I also do want to say it's just the beginning. The tools and the technologies we have developed in the, in the field of AI is, is really a, the first few drops of water in a vast ocean of what AI can do. We, can, we're, we cannot over 
、uh, promise this. But there is, there should be tremendous excitement that we can do a lot of, uh, 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 a lot of more work to to make this in AI in vivo happen. Uh, I share your excitement. This in vivo state. I mean, companies are putting virtual renditions of themselves in the cloud, and and then they're, they're using AI, you know, to to do things nobody ever thought was possible, and、uh, and AI is being used everywhere, <laughs> not just in the cloud. So thank you.、Um, if we dive a little deeper, Francoise, you've been. At the frontier of speech recognition, and now in application, speech recognition is actually becoming almost commonplace. Can you take us through that transition? Yes, certainly.、Um, so I joined Google about 12 years ago, and a bunch of us came with this vision of doing something useful and fun with speech recognition.、Uh, speech recognition had been around for quite a while. All of us had some background in the field. But we want to do something fun, and that was hard because speech wasn't the quality it is now. So we started with fairly limited products, where、uh, the task of recognizing what the person says wasn't too too complicated. We were just trying to push the envelope a little bit, but not too much, right? Because we needed to bring it to a place where the product was successful enough that people would want to use our application, and then. We could start, you know, folding data into the models and keep iterating from there. So we built what we called Gook 411. I don't know if any of you remembers that, but it was just a phone application. You would call a number, and then it would say, "Hey, what city and state?" And you would say what you were interested in, and then it would ask you about the business that you were interested in. You would say that name, and then it would offer to connect you to that business in that city and state. So. Again, picture that it's 12 years ago. There's no iPhone, no Android phone, right? All you have is that little flip phone that you put to your ear.、Um, so it was very basic. Fortunately, leadership at Google was really visionary about this technology and really encouraged us to push the boundaries as much as we could. And so we were successful with this first application, but then the iPhone and the Android phone came, so everything changed. Obviously, now there was visual feedback, so we started thinking about other applications, and that was voice search. So Google search by voice, and then we started doing dictation and having a little microphone in every possible entry point in your phone, so you could do everything with your voice, and.、Um, More recently, we've moved into trying to enable speech recognition within your home、uh, with devices like Google Home, and because people are asking for more and more tasks to be、um, fulfilled through voice, that was a really good entry point into the whole assistant story. Where instead of just enabling you to do very small things with your voice, now you can ask questions, you can phrase them in natural language, you can get really Google to be your assistant without this cumbersome, you know, physical keyboard input. Thank you,、uh, Fernanda. You you said you want to democratize data visualization now. And that's sort of inextricably linked to data. You know, how did you get to that? What are the needs you see for data visualization, analytics, and and how how's that evolved? Yeah. Yeah. So, I've started. I, I started working in data visualization over ten years ago, and when I did, it was much different.、Uh, it was much harder to do data visualization.、Uh, the、and、machines were, were not、time. nearly as good.、Um, <laughs> And there wasn't as much data out there that was publicly available.、Um, that started to change, and now we find ourselves in in an environment where people are interacting with data visualization, sort of everywhere. It's really exciting. It's been amazing to see like journalism take on data visualization and and talk about really complex stories、um, when they talk about statistics. We We always joke that data visualization is sort of the gateway drug to statistics. It's like you're doing statistics without even noticing that you are, because we're just visually so good at picking up patterns and outliers and so forth. So 
um, data visualization has been on this trend of becoming more um, democratized. And also, I, I really believe that people have, we have been increasing uh, people's ability to take in data and, and numeracy. And so data visualization has had uh, um, a role to play in that. In terms of AI, it's been really interesting because uh, we saw a major jump when, when, some, when you know, Jeff Hinton and colleagues proposed the first sort of, sort of blockbuster visualization for AI, uh, TSNI. Um, it's a technique that allows you to, so one of the big challenges with AI, with machine learning, is that these are systems that work in very high dimensional uh, spaces. And those are really hard for us as humans to understand. So visualization is one way that you can sort of peek and, and try to understand what's happening in these systems. And these techniques, such as the one that Jeff Hinton uh, uh, developed, allows us, uh, they allow us to sort of understand these, how things are clustering together, what are the relationships between different concepts, and how these systems are sort of resolving the data that they are ingesting. So I'd say that was a major, um, that was major progress. And the beginning, um, as Fei Fei was saying, I feel like we're also in the beginning of this relationship between how visualization um, can help um, AI. Uh, thank you. Now we're going to switch to a slightly more technical uh, set of answers to what's going on in the present. Uh, Francoise, maybe we'll start with you and, and talking about speech recognition technologies and what, ha what have the transition been and, uh, you know, and what were the challenges and what are they today? How have the challenges yeah. evolved? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, speech recognition is really complex, right? It, it's difficult to recognize what you're saying. Um, each one of us has a different voice, has a different accent. Um, we're speaking in different environments, so all that contributes to the richness of the voice. And I think mostly for that reason, speech recognition has always been based on machine learning. There hasn't been or not much of an earlier phase that wasn't machine learning based. It's just that the type of machine learning has been evolving over time. And uh, we kept making progress in, in the field for the last three decades. But I think one inflection point has been uh, the adoption of neural networks. And that has happened maybe eight years ago or so, um, maybe a little bit less. Um, but the, 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 the early research in speech recognition using neural networks happened a long time before. There was a lot of activity in the field. There were a lot of promising results. However, um, there wasn't the compute support to really make it happen. And so neural nets were a little bit abandoned for a while, and speech recognition kept improving with more basic methods like Gaussian mixture models and whatnot. Um, and then when we started really involving into deep neural nets, um, it was a big effort from an engineering viewpoint. We had to deal with latency issues, with size, with training capabilities, and so on. And uh, eventually, when deep neural networks became a reality, when we launched them, when we really had them in production, that opened the path to a whole bunch of other improvements. Because now, we had the capability of having that complex machinery there behind the, the technology. And so we could move very quickly from one neural architecture to the next. And so we started looking into recurrent neural networks, such as LSTM. We looked into uh, convolutional neural networks. And so um, CTC-based sequence modeling. We have a whole bunch of sequence modeling um, new implementations coming up. With Google Home, we have the neural beamforming. And so essentially, what's happening is that the, the move into the neural network space has opened this incredible capability for innovating the core technology that powers our systems and keep optimizing and you know, giving all of you in whichever language you're speaking the best possible accuracy we can. 
Okay, well, neural nets for speech recognition to neural nets for extending our lives and making us healthier. A fairly open-ended question for you, Daphne. You know, why does Calico need one of the top researchers in the world in, in uh, molec molecular biology, you know, biological computing and also machine learning? You know, as the chief computing officer, what are you doing over there? So many of you may not know of Calico because we've been a little bit under the radar. So Calico is one of the alphabet companies, the first one that was spun out of uh, Google, and it aims to understand the problem of aging and to help people um, live longer and healthier lives. Now, when you look at aging, um, you realize that it's actually the single largest risk factor for death. And I know that seems <laughs> kind of funny when you think about it, but it's true for almost every disease that happens after the age of 40, that as you grow older, year after year, the risk from that disease increases exponentially every year, um, whether it be diabetes or cardiovascular disease or cancer. Um, all of these increase exponentially. No one knows why that is. Why is it that every year of life after the age of 40 puts us at an increased risk for each of those diseases? Um, and in order to understand that, we really need to study the biological systems um, that exhibit aging at the molecular level all the way through the systems level and figure out what it is that's causing us to age. Because, you know, we, I don't think we'll live forever, but maybe we can live longer and healthier um, by interventions. Uh, one of our earliest scientists, um, Cynthia Kenyon, who came over to Calico from UCSF, showed that with a single gene mutation in the nematode C. elegans, you can extend its lifespan by something like 30 to 50 percent. And not only does the worm live longer, it lives as if it were a healthy young worm. Um, and you know, it's, it's in terms of reproductive health and movement and so on. So can we do something like that that would allow humans to live healthier? So that would be really cool, but in order to do that, there's a whole lot of understanding that we still need to gain. Um, and in order to do that, we need to gather data about all of those systems, all of which age, um, yeast age, worms age, flies, mice, humans, what is it that we all have in common at the molecular level? So fortunately, scientists have been able over the last 20 years to devise a whole slew of measurement modalities that allow us to get an understanding, or at least data, regarding um, systems as they age. And that includes techniques like um, sequencing and microfluidics um, at, the, at the low level and imaging, all the way through to things like um, track devices that track movement and allow us, you know, wearables to track movement and see how systems change as they age. But no human being has the capability to put together data at these different modalities that range all the way from subcellular to entire human populations. Um, all these different modalities that include DNA and RNA and, and mass spec and imaging and so on, all of the time scales that are involved from the subcellular scales all the way to the scales of an entire human life span. How do you put all these together into a coherent picture of what makes us age and what interventions are the most likely to be successful in slowing that aging process and making it better? So that that ability to interpret the data and make use of it really requires a true partnership between the scientists who are collecting and getting intuitions about these, uh, about these processes um, and the machine learning people who can help construct models that can synthesize and put the whole thing together. And neither of these communities can be successful on its own. I was one of the fortunate people who entered this field in its very early stages. So I've been working in the field of computational biology since um, the early 2000s. And as such, whereas I, you could say that I'm native in the language of machine learning, you could say that I have a, a, you know, a fluency in the biology, biological language. And as such, it allows me to work with the scientists at Calico to create a true partnership between those two disciplines and build models that, as I mentioned, 
mentioned earlier, is so important to combine the best of both worlds, the best of big data, but also the best of human intuition. Because um, biology is so complex that I don't think that even with the amounts of data that we're collecting today, we'll be able to reconstruct biology de novo from data alone. You need the data, but you also need the intuition of some of the world's best scientists. And so by working together at a place like Calico, we can get some of those insights as well as some of the enormous amounts of data that are currently being collected, and I'll come back to that later, to really construct an in-depth understanding of the biology of aging, and at the same time, try and predict which interventions might be helpful. Thank you, Daphne. I feel we should pause. A lot of <laughs> profound thinking. <laughs> Hang on to your hats. We're going to jump back to vision. And Fei-Fei, just the other day, you were quoted in TechCrunch as, as saying, vision is the, the, the killer app of AI. And so what do you mean by that? And what does it mean to democratize AI? And what does that have to do with the cloud? Yes. <laughs> so um, yes, I was actually trying to be provocative. And I stand by it. The quote is that while many people are asking for the killer app of computer vision, I would say the killer vision is the killer app of AI. So let me um, qualify that for, uh, by two reasons. The first reason come from nature. 540 million years ago, um, a remarkable event happened in animal evolution. Um, for some odd reason, the number of animal species went from very few simple species to an explosive uh, increase of the variety and the types of animals. It, it was co uh, considered the big bang of evolution or the Cambria explosion. And the uh, zoologists were puzzled for many, many decades about why this happened. And recently, a very convincing and prominent theory um, uh, conjectured it was the onset of eyes, animal vision. When eyes were first developed in animals, suddenly um, animal uh, had under uh, the animal life become proactive. There's predators and prey, and, and the, the whole evolution just changed. 540 million years later, humans are the most intelligent visual animals. In fact, nature devoted half of her brain for visual processing because of its importance. So that's one thread of um, one evidence. Another piece of evidence come from technology and the, live, the world we live in. If you look at our internet today, we're data is a wash. Well, YouTube alone sees 300 plus hours of videos uploaded every single minute. And it's estimated more than 80% of the entire cyberspace is in some kind of pixel form. And uh, you look at the sensors. The biggest data form that sensors capture are in some kind of images, whether it's visible spectrum or uh, um, a spectrum outside of visible lights, from biology labs to hospitals, from self-driving cars to surveillance cameras, um, everywhere the pixel format, data in pixel format is the most valuable data for consumers and, and companies. At cloud, I had the chance uh, to talk to a lot of customers. I have been all about the demand of image recognition, video processing, video analytics. So it's really exciting time for computer vision. Again, it's just similar to speech recognition, thanks to the um, um, progress of deep neural net, uh, vision has really taken off um, as a field have made a lot of progress. Uh, in the past 10 years, between 2010 and or well, seven years to 2017, I would say that the biggest progress in computer vision is the basic perception tasks, object recognition, image tagging, uh, object detection. We already have, you see products coming out of it, Google Photos, uh, pedestrian detection in self-driving cars, and all this. 
But the next fa uh, phase in, in, in investing in computer vision technology, in my opinion, is really uh, Vision Plus X. Vision, star vision is so fundamental in um, communication and language. How do we speak stories? How do we tag and, 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 and index um, um, videos? So the connection and interplay between vision and language is going to be extremely interesting. Then visioning biological sciences, whether we're uh, the, the, the throughput of data coming from biology and healthcare and medicine in vision form is, mm -hmm. is phenomenal. And uh, uh, be it radiology or, 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 or uh, laboratories. And I think there is a huge opportunity for vision to play. And, and one last example where I also want to give is uh, robotics. Uh, vision, um, speaking as a researcher, there is a lot of excitement now happening in the area of vision and robotics. We've been doing robotics for as long as AI ever existed, but robots are still not where they are. Most, to a large extent, it's because of its uh, uh, primitive uh, percep uh, perception system, and I think vision can play a huge role. So basically, I do think vision is one of the most um, important um, elements of machine intelligence and also for uh, the, the, the transformation of enterprise and companies. Thank you. Great perspective. <laughs> and I need to be careful because we're running out of time. Uh, so, Fernando, um, you know, how does, how does vision help visualization and visualization help machine learning? And maybe to save time, you can from that go into where you see the future, where you can take the visualization. Sure. Yeah. So, yeah, so to piggyback on uh, Fei Fei's um, answer here, we have this amazingly sophisticated vision system. We might as well use it to understand what these machines are, are doing, right? So machine learning runs on tons of data, tons of statistics and probability. Well, it turns out that data visualization can kind of be a secret weapon in trying to understand what's happening. And why do we care? Why should we care? We should care because of a bunch of dif different reasons. One is interpretability. Can you interpret what's coming out of your, of your models? Uh, second is debugability. Better understanding what's happening with your models will allow you to then debug them. Um, and then finally, there's also education. Visualization is already playing an important role when it comes to education about machine learning. And I also have a, a, f a final education piece there that I'm very excited about, which is when we start to understand better, um, when we use visualization to understand better what these systems are doing, then can we learn from them? Can we become better professionals, better domain experts in whatever? If I'm a doctor, if I'm an architect, whatever it is, how can I learn from these very specific uh, systems and, and then uh, be better as, as, a, as a professional? Another thing about visualization that I think is really powerful and really important to keep track of is the fact that by using visualization, we're always keeping the human in the loop. Right? And that is huge. And as we build autonomous systems, we want to make sure that they are behaving well. And so visualization can be helpful there. I want to tell you a very quick anecdote about a, a moment, a scientific moment, when visualization um, showed us something we didn't know before about a machine learning system. So last year, Google um, deployed its multilingual translate system, right? And it was, it was great. It was this really exciting moment of just putting a ton of different languages in one system and having the system somehow figure out how to translate from every pair of languages. The extra bonus was that it was able to do what is called zero-shot translation, where it was able to translate from pairs of languages it had not necessarily seen before. So, one of the fundamental research questions that the experts doing those systems had was how is the system resolving this space of multilingual data? Is the system creating something that looks kind of like you know, a model over here for English and a model over here for Spanish and another one for Portuguese? 
Or is the system doing something very different, where it kind of mixes everything up in the same spaces, and it's maybe learning something about the semantics and the meaning of words, and not necessarily what language it comes from or what language I'm translating to. So what we did is we built a visualization to look into this. And the really exciting point was when we started seeing that we, we visualized sentences that were being translated into a bunch of different pairs of languages. And the really exciting thing was when we saw clusters of sentences in these different languages show up together. So if I have a sentence that I'm translating from Portuguese to Spanish to English and vice versa, all of those representations showed up clustered together. And then another sentence here with all the clusters of all the languages. And then, so in other words, what did we find out? We found out that the system was not partitioning the space into different languages. The system was coming up with, an in, with, with a unique representation of those multiple languages. So in other words, we saw the first signs of a universal language, of something that we call interlingua. That was amazing. And so it was almost as if we had ran this multilingual system through an MRI. And we're like, whoa, these are the results. This is the other thing the visualization allowed us to do was to then look at neighborhoods that, were, that didn't look very well resolved, where a little language was kind of hanging out by itself. Those were translations that were not good. They were not high quality. So what that tells us is that the geometry of these spaces is meaningful. And if you have our neighborhood sort of hanging out in the periphery by itself, you might want to look at that. You might want to make sure that you debug your system, right? So these are kind of superpowers that you can have in understanding and, and um, making things better, making things work better. Um, and for the future, uh, one of the things I'm really excited about is, is uh, sort of goes hand in hand with something that Fei Fei, I think, is a, is a true advocate for, is democ democratizing AI. Visualization, I think, and other uh, techniques, it's not only visualization, but I truly believe that the more different kinds of people we bring into the fold of ML, the better off we're, we're going to be. Right now, AI still feels very engineering-centric. Mm -hmm. And I'm really curious what will happen when we bring in designers, UXers, scientists, as we're starting to bring in. What are the different possibilities? What are the different solutions that we haven't even thought about that we can then start exploring? Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Francoise, I feel like I should ask you, how's data visualization going to help speech recognition? <laughs> but I also wanted to ask you about as data gets more complex, you know, we've had all this labeled data for right. the training models, and we do more personalization. You know, where's the technology going, and what challenges are you excited about? You know? Yeah, yeah it, it's actually very interesting. Each time we, we jump into a new problem in speech recognition, we we really have to focus on it. In a sense, you know, when we started working on YouTube Kids, for example, which was a, a YouTube space for children, we really had to focus on those young voices. They don't speak the same way we do. They don't have the same pitch range. They don't have the same way of chopping words. You know, they take this deep breath, and then they have a burst of speech. So we really had to focus on it. And then eventually, we found a way of folding back that learning into our generic model so that Google Home, for example, would work with your children as well as it does with you. Um, but Google Home itself was also a new environment where we had to collect new data. And when that data is available to you, then it's easy to fold it into the models and keep retraining. But the first time you want to launch a Google Home device, you don't have it, right? And so we did a lot of simulations, taking data, adding noise of different types, doing uh, different types of reverberation on the data. And indeed, we use massive amounts of data. Uh, we transcribe tens of thousands of hours of speech, and then we multiply it with those simulations. If, if you do the math, it, it averages to something like you know, a handful of centuries of speech that we can fold into a model. So it's just massive amounts. And um, 
I think it, it's very interesting to think about how that scales to more problems with different acoustic characteristics, but also uh, to different languages. If I can ask you guys, like, you know, how many of you speak another language than English? Right? You see, all the hands are raising. So we really want to make our technology available to all of you in your own language. And if you think of it, it, it's a massive problem. How are we going to do that? Are we going to build one recognizer that works for all of you? Are we going to do like we do now, one per language? Well, how about dialects then? And how are we going to do when we have a language that's a fairly small one, small pocket of individuals? So if you ask linguists, they will tell you that there are 6,000, 7,000 languages in the world. They will tell you that there are about 1,000 of them, actually 1,342, they say, that have more than 100,000 speakers. So that's a lot, right? And if we want to really go into deep internationalization and serve all the languages uh, that have big populations on Earth, it's going to require a lot of creativity on the machine learning side to manage to share data among languages, learn from other languages, and so on. So I think it's really exciting, and there is still a ton of work to do in that domain. I agree. It's super exciting. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> we're we're going to go a little over so we have time to hear about the future from Feifei and Daphne. Um, Feifei, what excites you about what's possible going forward? Um, what excites me about what's possible going forward, let me just say one dimension. I, I think uh, I genuinely believe AI is one of the driving force of the fourth industry re revolution. It's, uh, it's just the beginning, but it, it has the potential to transform so the way humans live, work, communicate. And uh, um, one favorite line I heard from a philosopher is, there's no independent machine values. Machine values are human values. So one thing that really excites me is to include the diverse technologists in the field of AI to build the future together. Because once we have that diversity, uh, of representation in the field of AI technology, we will build the technology that is for the entire humanity, not just a slice of it. So, Yes, you have a lot of credibility when you say that, <laughs> Feifei. And Daphne, the intersection of biology and computing and, and everything else you've done, what... what, what yeah. Well, when I look at the progress that machine learning has made over the last um, five to ten years, and as a long-time AI researcher, if you'd asked me even five years ago, will computers be able to caption images without any kind of prior knowledge, just um, in, the, in the same quality that a human would, I would have said, nah, maybe in 20 years. And with the work of Feifei and others, we've been able to reach that milestone way sooner than I would have expected. Um, the reason I moved back to biology from Coursera is because I think we're hitting that knee in the curve in biology. So when you look, for instance, at some of the current predictions, there was a paper that was published in 2015 called Big Data um, Astronomical or Genomical. And it looks at the, at the number of humans, human genome sequence, which is a very limited part of biological data that's being captured. And you look at the historical trend, and that amount doubles every seven months which makes it about twice as fast as Moore's Law. So if you look at 2025 and you project that line, the number of human genome sequence by 2025 will be on a conservative projection, 100 million. And if you look at the historical trends, it'll be 2 billion. 2 billion human genome sequence, and that's just sequence that doesn't count RNA and proteomes and whole body imaging and cellular imaging. So we're at the cusp of the beginnings, I think, of really understanding what is the most complex system that we have encountered, which is that of a biological system. What is it that makes us alive? What is it that forces us to die? And so I think with that amount of data and the techniques that machine learning has developed and will continue to develop, we have an opportunity 
to really transform this um, science in, in this way. And I'm really excited to be able to bring those two communities together to make that possible. So there's clearly so much more that we could sit and listen to here. Uh, this has just been a phenomenally interesting and inspiring panel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Diane. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Terrific. Thank you for joining us here today. India is coming a long way, as I just mentioned. Today, India is the second largest country in the world in terms of number of developers. Soon, it's going to be number one. What we want to invest in is actually training the faculty from your colleges. The potential is so great, and what Google is doing to help catalyze that innovation is its really an exciting time for these campuses. We are really trying to provide the best possible experience to teachers in these faculty hubs, because the first step to training 2 million developers is to train the teachers that are going to teach those 2 million. Industry, as of now, demands a lot of uh, updated curriculum, developing 2 million Android developers. Uh, being working in a technical university, we can contribute hugely on developing those uh, million app developers. So we're excited that all the raw materials are there to create an innovation revolution in India. Uh, I really think the students are going to make some great things, and I can't wait to see what comes out. There's a lot of potential in India, and uh, we need to take it forward. With Google, we can provide rich opportunities to all. That is the essence of Google program, which I have seen. This is a good move. And this program will definitely be useful to, uh, to the students because app development is going to rule the world for the next few years, Billy. Let's now take a quick look at Google Cloud. There's two things that I want to check out, and Jen is here to tell us all about them. Hi, Jen. Hi, Timothy. So what's this? Because I really want to play with it. So this is Kubernetes Wackapod, and it is a demo in which you battle Kubernetes, uh, where you are trying to take down a service by being the cast monkey. While you're doing that, Kubernetes, which is a container orchestration framework, an open source project, will try and keep your web service up. That sounds like fun. I'm going to totally try and take it down. Yeah, give it a spin. I'm going to hit the button, and you're going to battle for 30 seconds. Ready? Here you go. So you're doing great. Kubernetes is bringing those containers right back up. And the yellow mole is special. It'll take out the entire web app in one go. Oh, and it's down. But Kubernetes is already bringing those containers right back up. You're doing great. Four, three, two. One, and you are done. So during your 30 second battle, you took out 58 sir, uh, pods and caused nine seconds of downtime. But it seems Kubernetes was victorious and getting about 70% uptime. But it's still a very good 
very good attempt. Awesome, that was a lot of fun. I love that demo. All right, so uh, I'd also like to check out Spanner, because I think Spanner is like one of the coolest things ever created. Spanner is pretty amazing. So I, I, I want to check out what this visualization is. Maybe you can give us a quick rundown of what Spanner is and then tell us what's happening here. Sure, so Spanner is a managed SQL database. Um, what makes it special is it is massively horizontally scalable and can handle huge amounts of traffic. And you still have the, the wonderful features you would expect from a SQL database, like queries and transactions and uh, other neat, shiny things like live migrations. Um, yeah, and it's fully managed, which is pretty cool. Who, who likes managing your database? This is a, a view of the schema that is uh, uh, an example schema on Spanner, which is the same thing being used to power the demo on the screen next. Now, if I can, I think one of the things that I've always really liked about Spanner is the fact that uh, it, it stays in sync, even though things are happening in different data sets. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, that's a great point. That's one of the, the special features of Spanner. Spanner, um, in, this, in this particular demo, we have Spanner running on three different data centers on three different continents all over the world, and yet, due to some magic involving atomic clocks and very precise timekeeping, we can still serialize all those transactions and maintain that consistency. That's cool. So what, what is actually happening on the screen here? So on this screen right here, we are simulating a pretty amazing ticket sales event, where apparently, uh, whatever this ticket sales event is, we are selling 137,000 tickets every minute. Um, and so far, this demo, which I believe we started this morning, has sold 238 million tickets uh, during its run through. Um, you can see that they're distributed across the world, and uh, even despite uh, all that really high throughput, we're still maintaining about a second of latency on those transactions. That's amazing. Okay. Uh, is there anything else you want to tell us about what's happening here at I.O.? Uh, it's a great show, but other than that, I think you found the fun spots. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Jen. Yeah, thanks so much, Timothy. Okay, see ya. I'll be honest, it's not a party if there's not a photo booth. So I found the photo booth, and the guy who built the photo booth, Alex, was going to tell us all about it. Hey, guys. Uh, so this is a talking photo booth. Uh, for an operating system, it uses Android things, and uh, you talk to it using the Google Assistant, and it uploads photos to the cloud using Firebase. Awesome, should so, we try it out? Yeah, let's do this. Where does it talk out of there? What about the speaker? Okay. Okay, Google, let me talk to the IO photo booth. Sure, here's IO photo booth. Hi, I'm the IO photo booth. Okay, taking a picture. Three, two. Don't look so serious. You're in a talking photo booth. One. Do you like it? Yes. Yes. Do you like the item style for your photo? Yes. Just a minute. Downloading style. <laughs> That's 56K, I can tell. Here you go. I'm uploading your photo now. Can I share this on my Twitter too? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Got it. Uploading your photo. Printing a link in the photo now. Don't forget to share your photo with hashtag IO17 and have a great time at IO. That was awesome. Thanks. <laughs> All right, thanks, Alex. All right, so I'm here with Doug from Firebase, and there's a lot going on in the Firebase area, a lot that developers have already been able to play with and like know pretty well, but there's also some new stuff, and I've asked Doug to show us some of that new stuff. Yeah, so uh, announced today, uh, actually yesterday at uh, Keynote, we found out that Firebase now has Firebase performance monitoring, which is a set of tools you can use to measure and monitor the performance of your app, so let's take a look at that. All right, so this is the dashboard. 
uh, what we have here is an overview of the performance of your app. So we have traces by frequency. You can think of a trace like a window of time that's of interest in your app. Uh, also, we can look at the latency of your network connections all over the world. We can also see the uh, success rate of your app over time. So it looks like things are getting a little bit worse for this app as time goes on. So that might be something to pay attention to. Now, if we drill into traces a little bit, we can see that uh, there are a collection of automatic traces. So we capture these for free uh, automatically. And here's some custom traces that have been defined by the app. So uh, you have the flexibility to write code to get some performance, or you can just let it do, uh, do things automatically. Now, if we go to network requests, we can get a breakdown of all the HTTP uh, transactions that are going in here. And you'll notice that there's some wild cards. So we're actually bundling up different kinds of requests that look the same, but actually have like different parameters. And you can see for this set of uh, APIs, what's the average response time, what's the success rate, and the number of requests that have gone through the system. You can click through to this and see uh, how it's going. So you know, you're probably using a lot of different SDKs. You probably want to know how they perform. You probably want to know how the app is performing from your user's point of view. And this is a great tool to get that done. Awesome, Doug. That's really cool. And it's really neat to see all the data in this way. Yep. No, it's definitely very helpful. Um, it's definitely also very interactive. It's not just a dashboard that you look at, it's a dashboard that you interact with. So. That's actually one of the really cool parts about being at I.O. is that if I were just to set this up on my app right away, I might not have all this data right away. But we're showing a demo here where we've collected a bunch of that data so you can see what it's like once you've invested for a while. Yeah, definitely. There's nothing worse than opening up a dashboard and having nothing staring you in the <laughs> face, right? You want It's nice to be able to see what you're getting into before you actually get into it. Absolutely. Good morning, everyone. Wait. Don't cheer us. Cheer the next speakers. So I'm Romain Guy from the, uh, representing the platform team on Android. And this is Tor Norby representing the tools team. But you're not here for, uh, for us. You're here for very special speakers. Yeah, so Romain and I have been incredibly excited about this uh, official announcement of Kotlin. We both love Kotlin, in case you hadn't noticed already. And we don't want to take any more time from the Speakers of honor. So without further ado, here they are. So hello, everyone. Oh, that's nice. So you know, I was thinking the other day, the first time that I ever did, did a talk in Kotlin, it was like uh, four and a half years ago. And they gave me a room for 900 people, and seven people showed up. <laughs> so uh, it's kind of nice to see more of you show up today. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, I'm got, I've got roughly around 30 minutes, actually 30, a um, little bit less, 28 minutes, to give you a whirlwind tour of Kotlin. So I'm not going to cover the entire language. I'm going to try and show you as much as I possibly can and how you can use it and where it provides you with some benefits. OK, so and I'm going to try and do it all with live coding. So if it all goes terribly wrong, um, there's a Google video. Of, I mean, there's a, a YouTube video of this somewhere as well. So 
Um, you can watch that. OK, so we're going to start with something very simple that you've already seen, data class. And I'm in a function, I'm in a file called main, right? So data class, I'm going to create a new type called money. And it's going to have an amount, which is of type int. I know, don't say anything for now. And it's going to have a currency of type string, OK? And this is both properties, and they're going to be read-only properties. So this is something that you're already familiar with. It's essentially a data class. Let's go ahead and compare that to a Java one that I have um, done earlier. So split vertically. And let's get the Java money up. Actually, let's get it on this side. Um, Java money. So there you go. That's kind of the equivalent of what I've just written, right? A, 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 a Java being essentially a data class that provides two getters. They're immutable, so they're read only. And this data modifier over here, what that's doing is essentially giving me a whole bunch of things like the two string. It's giving me uh, the clone, which in, co in Kotlin is called copy. It's doing the uh, equals. It's doing the hash code. Now you say, OK, well, that's great, brilliant. But why do I need that? Because any good IDE is going to generate that for me. It is true. It does. But the problem is that that's code you're going to have to maintain. And every time you add a new property, you're going to have to go back and change that code. And the other issue you're going to have is you don't know, in fact, if that code is the standard stuff that, Kotlin, uh, that your, you know, the IDE has generated for you, or you've tweaked it a little bit. OK? So it's not just about saving on typing on the, on the first line. Right. Now what I'm going to do is go ahead and create a function main. Let's close this guy over here. And this is like the top entry point of Kotlin. So you have a public, stack, public static void main in a class. You don't need that in Kotlin. So in Kotlin, you can put everything in the top level. It's kind of like JavaScript uh, in a good way. And so <laughs> you don't have to, um, like, and, and just I want to reiterate, like every, every function and everything that I'll show you today, I'm going to just add it in the file as a top level thing. But that doesn't mean that you don't have any more member functions. Anything, any class, even a data class can have member functions. But for brevity and for the purpose of what I'm showing you, I'm just going to put it as top level. OK? So I'm going to create a new instance of money. And we're going to call it, for example, tickets. And I'll say money, 100, and it's going to be dollars, right? And I'll get into um, the, the explicit type here. But es essentially here, what I'm doing is type inference. So Kotlin is very strong in type inference. And as much as it can infer, it will for you. So you don't have to explicitly tell the type. And then I'll say, for example, uh, popcorn. Uh, let's say tickets. Clone, uh, copy, right? So that's what that's going to do is basically copy the previous one for me and all of the properties. So if I don't pass any parameters in, it's going to just take the same values as it has before, OK? So I can pass in a new parameter, say, like, you know, I mean, in Spain, for example, popcorn is seven times the, ti the price of the entry of the cinema. So that's going to be like 500 euros, right? And now, I can do things like, for instance, you know, if uh, tickets is not equal to popcorn, then print line, they are different, right? So what this is doing is a property comparison one by one. It's not doing a pointer comparison. For pointer comparisons, we have the triple equal, right? Um, different to JavaScript, there isn't like a chart of 600 different positions you have to remember. So, and this, by the way, is uh, font ligatures, so don't get confused with that. We didn't introduce a new symbol. OK. So I can go ahead and just like uh, run this. And I get they are different. And if I change this to 100 and I put this as dollars and I run this, it's going to say to you that nothing because they are the same. OK? Now, one of the features we keep boosting about is the interop between Java and Kotlin. So we have this Java money one over here. So I'm going to go ahead and create an instance of it. And I'll say Java money equals Java money. And it'll be 100, and it'll be dollars. And then if I do Java money, you can see that I don't have any getters. Well, I do have actually a getter. So I can do get amount. But if I write get amount, complete it, the ID is already going to replace that for property. Because we don't have really like getters and setters. We just have properties. So that's consuming Java from Kotlin. And if I go over to the Java over here, and let's go ahead and create a public static void main. And I'll do um, 
So let's see, I've got to declare the type money equals uh, new money uh, 100 and uh, dollars. And oh, OK. That's the other thing. Um, the semicolons in Kotlin are optional. And the reason they're optional is so that you can have endless arguments over whether you should use them or not. <laughs> we're, we're trying to compete with JavaScript there. OK, so money.get amount. So now I'm using a Java type, uh, sorry, a Kotlin type from Java, so I'm getting the getters and the setters, right? So idiomatic depending on how you are using it. OK? And that's just you know, different Java files, different Kotlin files in a single project working seamlessly without any issues. Right, so now let's go ahead and create some functions. So I'm going to create a function called send payment that takes some money and money, and it's going to print line the money out. And of course, we have string interpolation, so I can say sending uh, money dot amount. And you don't have to put these curly braces if it's just a single property that you're passing in, as we'll just see in a moment. So now I can call this and say, for example, send payment uh, tickets, right? Now, Colin, we also have, notice one thing here, I'm not defining the return type, OK? By default, it's unit, which is kind of like void, but it's not. It's actually an uh, object, which is essentially a singleton and single instance of an object. And if it is a unit, you don't have to put it there, right? So I'm going to add a new parameter here, and I'm going to say, for example, with message, and this is going to have string, and you can have default parameters. So here, notice that there's no compilation error because I made a default parameter. This saves you a lot in terms of overloaded function, overloaded member functions, right? I can just you know, have default parameters and then do what I want. And you can have multiple default parameters. And since you can have multiple default parameters and you can uh, you know, alternate which one you want to pass in, you can also do named parameters. So in fact, I could say message equals um, good luck and money equals tickets, right? And this is kind of useful as well when you are using, you're talking to legacy code, for example, you know, some function that you can't modify and it's got 600 parameters and there are probably 800, 500 of them are true and false Booleans. It kind of gives you some insight into what uh, parameters I'm passing in in every position. Oh, yeah. I love it when people crap, uh, crap, clap. Uh, <laughs> And, um, and I'm thinking to myself, well, this is going well. Anyway, right, let's go um, edit that out, like um, adult supervision. Right. One other thing with Kotlin is that when we have functions that are really, really easy, uh, like essentially returning a single value, you can just do single, single expression functions. So I omit the re return type explicitly. I omit the curly braces, and I just return the, the actual function that I want to do. OK? So in fact, this is like the concept of expression comes in many places in Kotlin. So for instance, let's create another function that's called convert to dollars. Convert to dollars. And this is going to take a money, money, and it's going to return money. And then what we're going to do here is a when statement. So that's essentially a case, right? So when money currency uh, is dollars, then we'll do return money as is, right? Because I don't need to do anything. And if it's euros, then what I'm going to do is return. Uh, we're going to do money uh, amount times uh, Sorry, I've got to create a new instance. Money, and then it's going to be money amount times a big decimal, 1.10, and then that's going to be dollars, right? And else, throw illegal argument exception, uh, not the currency you're interested in. OK, so. This, you can actually treat a when as an expression. So I can, return, I can remove this return over here, remove this return over here, put it just here, and then this just makes the when always return an expression. And in fact, you can even remove the return here, return, remove the money here, and remove that there, and you get a single expression. Okay? 
single expression function. Now, one thing that you notice here that this is giving me an error because this is, uh, you know, I'm trying to operate a big decimal with an int. So we're going to go and refactor this. Um, I'm going to call it big decimal. OK? Now, talking about big decimal, oh, here we go. Big decimal, big decimal, 100, and big decimal. I love typing big decimal. I love it. OK? So we've got this over here. Now, if you look at actually um, big decimal, so if I create a new big decimal, we'll call it BD1 equals big decimal 100. You can see that BD1 gives me a whole bunch of functions like divide, multiply, all of these things. What if I wanted to do something like a percent? I wanted to do a percentage of big decimal. Now, normally you would basically uh, inherit from that and then create your own version and have all of these things. But in Kotlin, one of the features that we've added, and if you're familiar with C Sharp, is called extension functions, which essentially means that you can take any class, any type, and extend it. So I can take fun, uh, a function big decimal. I put the name of the class that I want to extend, and I say I want to do a percent. And what is the percentage that I want to uh, do, for example, an integer? And then it would be, let's see. So given that this is an extension function, it's going to have an instance of that uh, class of that object, right? So I can use that, reference that with this. And I say this um, multiply by the percentage, and then this has got to be wrapped in a big decimal again, percentage, and then that divide, and then another big decimal, uh, 100. And what's wrong with this? That should be percentage. So percentage. OK? So now what happens is that on BD1, I have percentage. OK? And I can do percent 7. And that would give me a 7%. And that extension function gets included anywhere where it is defined in the package. Right? So here in this case, I have it in comjetbrains.go, and that will get included there. Right? So you can create extension functions. And we'll see that the standard library actually consists of a whole bunch of extension functions. Now we'll take this one step further, because I can actually extend everything. So let's go on ahead and extend an integer. So I'll say fun int uh, percent of, and here we'll do the reverse. So I want like 10% of something, right? So I'll say money, for instance, I want 10% of money. And that's going to return the, let's see, it's going to return money, right? Then it will be amount, multiply. And then here, it's going to reference the actual instance. So it will be this. And again, this has to be wrapped in big decimal. And then divide by 100. OK? And I think I got that in the right order. If the implementation is wrong, doesn't matter. Who cares? Anyway, so now what I can do is something like this. 7% uh, per percent of big decimal. 100. OK? Oh, no, sorry. Money. So I can do money. No, don't clap yet. Um, <laughs> money. Oh, well, let's just take the money I have. 7% of popcorn. OK? Nice? <laughs> let's, let's do a little bit nicer. What I want to do is, that in fact, something like this. I want to do 7% of popcorn. That would be nice. And you can actually do that. You see that little wiggly there, squiggly? Alt, Enter, Add, Infix. There you go. OK? So any extension function that, can, that has a single parameter can be called in Infix notation. And what I've done is essentially add the Infix over there. And this is some of the things that allow you now with Kotlin to kind of create the whole um, DSL approach to things. Right. So one thing that I hated doing here is all of this big decimal. That's a pain. Right? And in Kotlin, you, when you want to create a, a value of type long, you can say long 100L. And that will be of type long. And it would be awesome if I could do like, you know, well, BD2 equals 100 um, BD. But you can't. And we don't have that built in. But what we do have in Kotlin is called extension properties. So they're exactly like extension functions, except they extend with properties. So I could do something like dot BD. Right? And now. Or let's, uh, yeah. So now, see, it even says, hey, do you want to create an extension property on type integer? Yes. So this is going to return a big decimal, right? And then 
here I'm going to do return big decimal and this, which is the instance, right? And I can, in fact, convert this to an expression to make it easier, right? So there you go. Now I have 100.bd. So when I'm passing that in, it looks much nicer than big decimal. I could just do 100.bd. OK? And one other thing around functions that you can do is there are certain operators that you can extend. So you can extend, for example, the plus operator. And what I'm going to do is I'm not going to type this out. I've just got a nice little thingy that has done that for me. See how fast I am at typing? Um, so what I've essentially done is now override the plus operator for money. So now I can say how, uh, costs equals tickets plus popcorn, right? And that allows me to add two monetary amounts. OK, and you could do that with plus, minus, multiply, a bunch of built-in uh, conventions that you can follow for certain operators that allow you to do that. OK, so we've been creating a whole bunch of types here. And let me go ahead and delete all this stuff so we can focus. Uh, we've been creating a bunch of types here. Notice that in any of these types that I've created, I've never actually specified the type. And you can. So I can do, for instance, um, valve. Uh, train costs, for example, train uh, is of type money, and then initialize it to some new value, right? 100.bd and then dollars. Now, if I go ahead and do train equals null, it's going to give me an error. And it's going to give me actually two errors. One of them is because that's immutable variable. So I can fix that. I've now made this mutable. You see that the IDE underlines it. So it kind of like wants to point it out that you know this is really something you're going to shy away from. We don't enforce immutability in Kotlin, but we kind of do recommend it. Like all of the lists and all of these things are immutable by default. So I can't assign null in Kotlin because Kotlin tries to get rid of the null pointer exception by saying that types aren't nullable by default. Right? But there are times when you want to have a type that is nullable for whatever reason. You, you're bored. And you can add a question mark, and then that will give you the ability to assign null to that type. Right? Now, normally when you're working with Kotlin, you probably don't want to do this. You probably don't want to have nullable types. But since we're interopping with Java, Java can be null. So if I create a function here that is, for instance, fun uh, Java money, and that takes uh, money of type Java money and does whatever with it, right? So let's say I do print line uh, money dot amount is valid. So this can be null. It could, you know, if it's called by an instance that a function that, for example, is returning this type, it could be null. And you can indicate that by adding the question mark. When you do that, you can see that the IDE is going to give you an error, right? It says only safe operators or the double exclamation mark are valid here. Because it's essentially saying you're going to run into a null reference exception. So there's two ways you can solve this. First of all, you can say, for example, money um, not null, and then do like a if not null, then go ahead and operate with it. You know, put this, um, put this one up, upstairs in there. OK? That's one way. Or the, Shorter way is just to use the safe operator or Elvis operator, which is over here. So now we just say, if money is not null, then do something. Now, if you want to have fun, you can also do that. And that says, I know it's null, but I want to shoot myself in the foot. OK? <laughs> and you've got to be careful with that, because you laugh. But a lot of times when people start with Kotlin, they get all of this like little uh, squigglies over here. And they're like, well, I actually don't know if it's going to be null, because I really want it to not be null. So I'm not going to handle the case where it's not null, so I'll just do that. And then they run the app, and they're like, wait a minute. You said Kotlin got rid of null reference exceptions. Yes. OK. What else? Right. So let's switch to some other stuff, like uh, higher order functions. Now, you're all familiar with a higher order function, which is basically a function that takes a function or returns a function. And we have those in Kotlin. So we can say find emails, uh, users, list of user, and then I'll create a new function, which is a predicate. So I'm passing in a function here, right? A, a function that takes a string and returns a Boolean, OK? And then this probably is going to return a list of users. So essentially, what I'm doing is I'm filtering on a list of users, right? So 
I'll do this later. Uh, to do later. OK? Um, this to do, by the way, is built in. You can use it instead of not implemented uh, exception, a non implemented error. And it does an additional thing that well, we won't get into. But nothing is actually very nice in Kotlin. But we won't cover that now. It's nothing to worry about. I just made that up. OK, good, good. OK, thank you. So now, how do I use this? So I can do find emails, right? And I'll say, I actually have a user. Let's create some users here. So users from JSON file. And I have some users over here, so users JSON. So this is actually, um, this is actually a function that I have ready, which is basically using JSON to read some users from a file. And this is a typical data class that you've already seen. The only new thing here is that this also got an enum class of, uh, with a property role. OK? So now I can do like users, and then I'll pass in that function. Now I can pass in the name function by using the colon colon reference, or I can pass in a lambda. And in Kotlin, lambda follows this syntax. You pass in the, uh, the parameter name, and then you say, for example, the parameter name ends with uh, .com. Right? So I'm getting a list of users that end with .com. Now, when you have a single parameter in Kotlin, you can actually omit having to explicitly mention it and replace it with it. OK? So similar to Groovy, you can just use it. The other thing that you can do in Kotlin is when the last parameter to a function is another function, you can actually not include it in the brackets. So it feels a little bit like it's outside. And this is, again, one of the characteristics that allow us to create nice DSLs. And you can even do this like multi-line. So if you look at find emails now, in a sense, it could actually feel like it's part of the language. But it isn't. It's actually a function. And when we, had, we implemented asynchronous programming with uh, uh, coroutines, we didn't like, you know, if you're familiar with C Sharp, C Sharp does the sync await, their keywords in the language. In Kotlin, they're not. They're essentially just functions. Okay, so that gives you the flexibility of deciding how you want to do uh, different things. Now, you don't have to do all of these things because all of these things are built in. So, for example, if I say .com users, I say users filter, and you can see that as I complete this, it actually opts for the version of including out of the parameter. So I can say the um, email ends with com and then I can go and uh, sort by it dot uh, ID and then let's go ahead and do for example map that to a pair of uh, it dot email and it dot username okay so all of these functions are actually built in in that small standard library that ships that you're not going to have problems on Android it's very small and they're all in essentially extension functions on top of collections, generic collections, right? So you have all of those functional things that uh, you know, are very um, in, in fashion these days. And so this obviously gives me a pair. And in fact, you can do this even nicer if instead of doing pair, it to, so map email to username. And guess what it is? It's just an infix function that creates a pair. OK? Now, sometimes I don't want to go through the whole map. I just want to, for example, say, get back a, a single element. And what you can also do is destructure uh, classes, uh, uh, data classes in, in Kotlin. So I could do something like ID, username, and email. OK? And then I could just like, you know, use the ID. And this is great, but then the IDE complains and says, well, this variable is never used. In that case, you can actually replace that with an underscore, right? So there you go. And you can destructure the values you want. Anything that you don't want to use, replace with an underscore, and you're good to go. Right. So what else can I show you? OK. So I've got some other code here. If you're familiar with the concept of algebraic data types, it's essentially one type, a type that can be of one type or another, like, for instance, a Boolean. Now, in Kotlin, the way that we do that is with seal classes. But before I get into that, let me go ahead and do an open here. Right? Notice the first thing here, that user result is giving me an error. Because by default in Kotlin, you cannot inherit from classes. So all classes are essentially final. If you want to inherit from classes, you have to use the open uh, modifier. right? 
Now, I've used the sealed. And the sealed is essentially saying that this is the hierarchy that a uh, user result has. Like, there's not going to be any other class anywhere that is going to inherit from user result. Everything that's going to inherit from user result has to be in the same file. Or you can make these, of course, subclasses. So I could move this up there, and this would be a subclass, but then I would have to prefix it with user result, right? OK? Now, I've just created it as a class outside. So why would I want to do this? Because it looks good. No. Well, this is actually good because when you're doing some things, it's often like you're, you're invoking a function and you're like, OK, well, if it's successful, I want it to return a value. If it's not, I'm, I'm going to pass in a message. And then you get up like this type that contains the values that you want to return when it's successful. It contains the types that you want to return when there's a message. And then you've got to figure out the semantics of which properties are uh, applied to an error situation, which properties are applied to a non-error situation. Or you can just throw an exception. In this case, you can use a function that basically returns two types. And then based on the result, do different things. So here I say, for instance, when uh, let's create an instant uh, val uh, result equals user result. Sorry, retrieve users. OK, so now I can do when result is success, then we're going to do, for instance, well, we're going to get the result, and then we're going to do uh, users for each, oh, for each print line, the name. OK? Username. And then we're going to do a failure result print line result dot message. OK? So now, based on the result, based on the type that is returned to me, I can do different things. And notice one thing over here, that this has gone green. I don't know if you see it on the big screen, but this has gone green. And this is a smart cast. So that's another thing that we have in Kotlin. And you saw that when I was doing the null check, that it said this is not null, because it's smart casting. So you don't have to explicitly come over here again and say, oh, you know, I know that this is of type success. Let me go ahead and cast this to type success to then access the property. The compiler will do that for you. That's what the smart casting is. Right. And last but not least, before I hand it off to Andre, quickly just mention also that a lot of the things that you've been seeing, seeing with the filter map, all of those things, those are essentially uh, eager, eager evaluation, right? But we also have the ability to do lazy evaluation. So I can do val, for example, sorry, generate sequence and then have something, for instance, one. And then here we'll do uh, it times 10. And then we'll do uh, values, right? Now I'll say values, take 10, and then for each, print line it. Now this is essentially creating a sequence, a generator that is infinite. It's never going to stop. It's going to start at 1 and multiply by 10. But what I'm saying here is that I just want to take 10 elements and then print them out. And what it will do is basically consume that until it hits 10. It prints out a uh, go away. It prints out a beautiful Christmas tree that's one-sided, OK, pyramid, whatever, and stops there. And anything that you have, like, for example, the users that we had, uh, you know, users from JSON, users.json, you can say as sequence and convert it into lazy evaluation as well. OK? That's all we have the time to show you today. Obviously, there's way more to the language. Uh, go online, learn everything about it. And thank you very much. And I'll hand it off to Andre. Thank you, Hadi. Hello, everybody. So as you've seen, Kotlin already has uh, many things in store. But I'm the nasty person who adds new features before you learn the, the existing ones. So I'll be telling you stories now, uh, but I'll need to find a clicker. Do I have a clicker? No. OK. Uh, OK, so I'll be uh, telling stories without a clicker. Uh, so my job here is to tell you about what we're go going to have in the future versions of Kotlin. Oh, thank you very much. OK. Um, 
And uh, first big thing uh, we're working on now is platforms, supporting diff different platforms. So historically, Kotlin compiles to JVM bytecode, uh, same as the Java programming language. Uh, so we can run on the server, on the desktop, and of course, of course on Android. Uh, and uh, it's just the same bytecode everywhere. This is why we can run old versions of Android as well as new ones. But uh, the story doesn't end there, uh, because we are adding new platforms. And uh, uh, recently, we've added oh. <laughs> the god doesn't like platforms. Uh, uh, recently, we added JavaScript, which means Kotlin can now compile to uh, JavaScript code and run in the browser or on Node.js. Uh, so now we support uh, three major, very popular virtual machines, JVM, Android, Dolvik, and JavaScript VMs. Uh, but there are many use cases where a virtual machine is not practical or is simply unavailable. For example, for iOS, uh, uh, virtual machines are severely restricted. You can't do uh, dynamic code generation. Or for a small embedded system, a VM doesn't fit in. Or for, um, say, a Linux command line tool, uh, the VM will be starting to, uh, for too long. So it's a no-go there. And that's why we're working on something called Kotlin Native. Uh, it's currently available as a technology preview. Uh, and there, we basically use LLVM to compile Kotlin down to native code to standalone binaries that can run on different platforms. Currently, we support iOS, Linux, and Mac. And Windows is in the works. So uh, this is taking us to uh, you know, this vision with Kotlin, when it can run uh, inside an every component of a modern application on any platform you like. So think full stack web applications with uh, uh, the server and the client both written in Kotlin, or think we use uh, code between mobile platforms, Android and iOS, for example, or mix uh, the two previous use cases and get like a real multi-platform scenario. So uh, our vision for Kotlin is uh, having different modules in the same project uh, compiled to different platforms. And of course, you, you want to share code there, right? Because if, if you support so, so, so many different things, you want to run the same code in different places. And uh, we're working on making that possible. But there is an, a very important thing, because uh, previously, many projects tried to unify platforms. And this often ends up being like the least common denominator when you take only things that are available on all, all platforms, you're, you're basically stuck with a minimal interface. And that's something we don't want to have there. So we want you to be able to use all the platform-specific fancy APIs, like the newest version of Android or something else, as much as you like. Uh, and if you want to share some code, only then uh, you have to resort to um, some common APIs. So the idea there is that you have a common module with lots of business logic and stuff. And it can work side by side with a platform-specific module written also in Kotlin. And those two can talk to each other. So when you need, you leverage the platform API. And when you need, you use the uh, common code. So takeaway here, our future is multi-platform. Uh, next. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, next big thing uh, is coroutines. So uh, the rationale there is pretty straightforward. Everybody needs to write asynchronous code, right? Because the world is too big now for sequential execution. And it's, yeah, it's, it's our reality, but it's hard, right? Uh, who has written asynchronous code? Ah, quite so many hands. Uh, th those of you who don't actually will be doing this very soon. Uh, and the problem is that it's rather hard, actually, to write sequential code. Or it was hard before languages learned to, to support you in doing that, because a language can help you there a lot. So basically, what we have with coroutines in Kotlin, you write asynchronous code the same way you write synchronous code. So what do you use in synchronous code? Loops, ifs, breaks and continues, things like that, right? And it's the same things you're using with coroutines for asynchronous code. Uh, so that the language keeps uh, track of everything, and you don't have to express any intricate control flow for asynchronous computation in your code. Uh, no callbacks, no fancy functional structures. It's just plain old sequential looking code. And isn't it cool? <laughs>
thank you. Uh, yeah, so the idea with coroutines is that uh, you basically have the same abstraction for uh, asynchronous and synchronous. And also, it's, uh, it's a nice metaphor to think of them as uh, almost three uh, free threads. Like, uh, here's the only code example I'm showing you. Uh, basically, very many things that are traditionally done with threads can be done with coroutines, but coroutines are extremely cheap. So here on the slide, I have uh, a code that creates 100,000 coroutines. Think about that. 100,000 coroutines existing in parallel, and each one of them uh, waits for one second and returns one. Uh, so this program uh, completes in uh, uh, completes in one second, almost one second, because all the coroutines wait in parallel, of course. But if you try to do this with threads, it just doesn't work. 100,000 threads don't fit into memory. That's it. So uh, with coroutines, it's a win-win situation. Uh, you get lots of performance, so it's, it's very efficient, and the code is simple. So take away here. Uh, Check out coroutines, because our future will likely be even more asynchronous than our present. So I'm almost done. And if you want to learn more about Kotlin, check out our website. We have a section for Android. Uh, and also, we'll have uh, a uh, question and answer session right after this talk. Uh, so come over to the uh, developer sandbox, section C. Uh, myself and Hattie will be answering questions there. So thank you very much for your attention. So you've built an amazing mobile app that your users are going to love. But you want to get it into people's hands and let them see just how awesome it is. Well, AdWords helps you do this, putting ads for your app in front of billions of people that use Search, YouTube, Google Play, and more. You can quickly set up an ad campaign to reach the type of users that might be interested in your app. You only pay if the user clicks on that ad, and you can set the budget and acquisition costs that you're comfortable with. But how do you know you're reaching the right users? Maybe some will install your app and forget about it, while others will make it part of their daily lives. Firebase Analytics helps you do this. You can define events that happen in your app that you consider to be important, such as reaching the first level of your game, purchasing a fancy new pair of sunglasses, or returning every morning to check out new products. You can tell AdWords which of these events are most important to you. Then, AdWords will display ads to people who are more likely to complete these important actions in the future. You can also build audiences, which are specific segments of users, and have AdWords display your app to them. For example, imagine that you have a group of users who are very active, have added a product to their cart, but haven't purchased yet. Well, you can use Firebase to create an audience of just these people, and then use AdWords to give them specific ads and encourage them to come back to your app and take action. Understanding your users and engaging with them at just the right time and in the right way will help you build loyal users for your app. Firebase and AdWords, working together to help you grow your user base. Get started today. Your new users are waiting.
Android Instant Apps make it possible for users to access your app without having to install it first. Imagine users opening your app just by clicking on a link in an email or a text message. We've recently made Android Instant Apps available to all Android developers. To take full advantage of this, we have some best practices to help you make your Instant Apps user experience as great as that in your installed app, or maybe even better. You can find all this and more at the URL in the description below. It's important to keep in mind that by enabling your app to run instantly without installation, you're not creating another additional app. We're thinking of Instant Apps as another way to use the app your users already know and love. It's the same app, just without installation. By adding the ability to access your app directly from a link, a search result, or another app, it's much easier for users to engage with your app and get excited about it. If they decide to keep your app on their device permanently, they can then install it right from within the Instant App. The ability to launch an app without having to install it provides an enormous opportunity. For a long time, app developers have focused on the number of app installations as a proxy for the metrics their business really cares about. Without installation, users simply weren't able to engage with the developer's offerings at all. Removing this barrier to entry enables you to think about the metrics your business really cares about. Your audience is now just one tap away from engaging with your service. Your instant app is just another mode your app can run in. So don't branch your UI and make any unnecessary, cha unnecessary changes regarding the layout, interface, design, or experience of your instant app. The transition from instant to installed mode after installation should be as smooth and seamless as possible. Your users should have a rich and full app experience, even if they haven't installed your app. Rather than thinking of instant apps as a limiting factor to what your audience can do, think of it as an opportunity to get them to your functionality quicker and a way to foster your relationship with them. Avoid prompting your users to install the app when they're in the middle of a task. They'll be much more inclined to place your app onto their device permanently after it has had the opportunity to prove its usefulness. Refrain from bouncing them back and forth between your instant app and your mobile web offerings. You can probably tell by now, instant apps are all about removing friction for your users and getting them closer to your functionality. Think about ways you can remove further barriers for your users. For example, wait until users can see the benefit of making an account and signing in until the value of doing so becomes apparent. Asking users to create an account after installation seems like a small additional ask when they've already gone through the app installation flow and are only just getting started. However, when they're coming from a link looking for specific content or functionality, being asked to register can feel very disruptive. Additionally, make sure to use available APIs to make your and your user's life easier. Using Google Smart Lock, for example, makes signing up and signing in a much simpler and straightforward experience. In summary, we really think that instant apps will unlock a lot of opportunity to engage your audience more directly. Users will be able to focus on what it is they want to accomplish rather than having to spend time maintaining and updating apps on their phone. We're super excited to see what you come up with. Everything I talked about here and much more you can find on g.co slash instantapps. Thanks for watching. Firebase makes sending messages to your users easy with Firebase Cloud Messaging. It's a free service that allows you to send messages to your users' apps across a variety of platforms. Messages can be addressed to single devices, groups of devices, or even topics. Building a notifications or messaging system with Firebase Cloud Messaging is easy. First, you register your users' app instance with the Firebase Cloud Messaging servers. Then, on your server, you write code that allows you to address these devices by ID, group, or topic, and which tells the Firebase Cloud Messaging server to send the messages for you. It's powerful, it's scalable, delivering hundreds of billions of messages per day, with 95% of messages being delivered within 250 milliseconds to connected devices across many different platforms. It's that easy, it's that powerful. Firebase Cloud Messaging.
people love to use different mobile devices in different ways that suit their situation and lifestyle. Michael uses a phone to play games on the go, while Tony enjoys using a large tablet as he relaxes on the sofa. And Jen carries a small tablet in her purse for reading on the bus. But they all want to use your app on the devices they prefer. So you'll want to make sure they each have a great experience, regardless of screen size, OS version, and the features of the app they use the most. It can be taxing to test each one of these situations so that all your users can be happy. We know you'd rather not have to buy and store stacks of devices and test your app in all these circumstances. That's why we built Firebase Test Lab for Android to make it easy and affordable for you to test your app with a variety of devices and be sure it works great for all your users. Our device lab, hosted in the cloud, offers a variety of physical devices ready to test your app. The selection of devices is always growing, so your tests will stay current with the latest hardware and operating systems. The easiest way to use Firebase Test Lab is to run a robo-test. This is an intelligent, automated test that crawls your app to discover and exercise its features. You won't need to write any additional code to make use of a robo-test. For more advanced testing, you can also script the interactions with your app to simulate specific use cases and verify that everything works as expected. Test results include a detailed report for each device used, including screenshots, device logs, and any crashes that may have occurred during the test. This allows you to verify that your app is working correctly on the variety of devices and configurations you selected. It's easy to make Firebase Test Lab a part of your daily development routine, and we have multiple ways to help you test regularly and spot errors early. First, you can use the Firebase console to upload and test your app. There is also a command line interface for testing with continuous integration servers, so you can automatically test every build. During Android development, you can deploy your app directly to Firebase Test Lab using Android Studio 2.0. And finally, in the Play Store Developer Console, there is a special automated launch test that will run for Android apps published to an alpha or beta channel. To get started using Firebase Test Lab and learn how to regularly test your app on different devices and configurations, you can start with the documentation available right here. Happy testing! When I was 10 years old, my dad got me a book on Pascal. And just a few chapters in, I immediately realized I can create some amazing things all by myself. My name is Shruti Saraf, and I'm a founder and game developer at Blacklight. I always remember my mom playing solitaire on a computer. But when moving to mobile, she struggled to find a good solitaire for her phone. So she insisted that being a game developer, plus her daughter, I should develop solitaire for her. So I took the idea to Sumit. I'm Sumit Soni and I'm co-founder at Blacklight. I'm 32 years old and I have 25 years of game experience. Playing them and now designing them. We played Solitaire for hours. We even bought a deck of cards, real cards, to understand the game better. 60% of our users are mommies and grannies, so we designed Solitaire keeping them in mind. Big bold cards, soothing colors and minimal design, taking a lot of cues from Google Material Design Guidelines. It took us six months of research and design to make Solitaire look great and be really fun to play. And then we noticed a lot of visitors are uh, visiting our page, but very few of them downloaded the game. So we thought maybe the logo is the problem. We experimented on Google Play with a modern design and a very old-fashioned one. And wow, the old-fashioned logo had 54% more downloads and after we adopted it, our total downloads went up by 90%. Plus, we moved to Android Studio, which allowed us to integrate Google Play game services, and emulators helped us design user interface for different screen sizes and varied pixel density. The feeling that something you have created is adding fun and value to so many people around the world, most of them from places I've never been to, can be quite profound. Shruti's love for coding and her mom's love for Solitaire led to this. Today, we have five more games in the pipeline, and we hired five more Android developers to work on them. It definitely wasn't a smooth journey, but through hard work and great use of feedback, we are where we are today, and we can't wait to see what we do next.
Android Wear 2.0 is the most significant update to Android Wear since its launch in 2014. I'm Hoi Lam, and I'm here to take you through three highlights of Android Wear 2.0. First, material design has arrived on Android Wear. The new Android Wear interface uses a darker color palette, which makes the watch blend in more in social environments. It also helps save battery by OLED displays. We also suggest that developer adopts vertical layouts and reserve horizontal swipe for activity dismissal. In our research, this makes user interface easier to understand. To help developer implement these new design patterns, we have introduced new user interface components, such as the wearable drawer layout and wearable recycler view. Check out the material design for Android Wear site for more details. The second highlight for Android Wear 2.0 is watch face complications. Before Android Wear 2.0, if a watch face wanted to display data from another app, they need a one-to-one -one agreement in both business and technical terms. To alleviate this complexity, with Android Wear 2.0, we have introduced the Complications API. Complications are a traditional watchmaking term for areas of the watch face that displays information other than the time, such as the date or faces of the moon. We have extended this concept to smartwatches, so any app can publish data for watch faces to consume. And watch faces can display these data in a style that fits into their unique designs. For app developers, this helps increase user engagement and mindshare. For watch face makers, this adds utility to the watch face. Users can now choose whichever watch face they want as well as getting the data that they need. Check out the watch face and complication sections of the developer documentation for more details. Last but not least, standalone functionality. Previously, Android 1.0 apps require a phone app to communicate with the cloud. With Android 2.0, Wear apps can access the internet directly without the need for a corresponding Android phone app installed. This means the Android Wear app can access the internet even if the user has an iPhone. To help with app distribution, we have also put the Google Play Store on the watch. Users can now download apps directly on their wrist. Apart from these three areas of improvement, material design, complications, and standalone apps, there are numerous other enhancements with Android Wear 2.0. Check out the Android Wear developer site for more details. I'm Hoi Lam. Happy coding. Have you played AppShift 3000? No, but I'm ready to. And I'm standing here with Abe, who uh, helped build this fantastic experience. Abe, tell me all about it. Yes, this is AppShip 3000. This is a collaborative Firebase trivia game where three people work together to launch their AppShip and hit their moonshot. It's uh, pretty crazy, played with arcade controllers out here in this very loud situation where it makes you yell to each other and get all hyped up. It's a lot of fun. Awesome. So we're going to play it, and uh, maybe I'll give you the microphone, and you can sort of narrate what's happening and yeah. maybe talk a little bit about the tech. Absolutely. Great. So uh, for my fellow team players, we've got Doug over here. Doug, take a bow. And Todd over here, who you may know from such things as everything Todd does. <laughs> All right, Dave, I'm going to give you the mic. Yep, everyone's already logged in and they're sitting with their rocket primed for ignition. In order to take off, everyone has a specific color they need to hit. So let's give it a countdown. In three, two, one, take off. There we go, there we go. Now in the game of App Ship 3000, the very first thing that happens is you will get prompted to ask, have you played before? Everyone here has, which is good. And we'll dive right into the game. The very first question, who has it? There you go, there you go. Those blinking things up at the top are asteroids, which will absolutely destroy you. Good, good. <laughs> good, good. I'm amazed you knew that. Good job. <laughs> How many Google engineers does it take? Lovely. Good call, good call. 
Yeah, you cannot be a true not be a true fire baser if you think uh, pineapples are ugly. All right. While this game's running, I'll talk a little bit about what's happening. But it's a little hard since they're all shouting all the time. If somebody pick something, you're running out of time. Oh. All right, all right. So while they're playing this game, every movement they make is being thrown off into the Firebase real-time database. And the real-time database is taking that, doing some analysis, updating high scores, and things like that. So absolutely every move they make is getting thrown off into Google Cloud and Firebase for analysis. <laughs> all right, all right. Oh, you got to watch out for those asteroids, guys. No, it is not it. Definitely not it. <laughs> Up, oh, we're low on fuel, low on fuel. If you miss this next question, you are done. Uh, oh, you're so close. Oh. <laughs> oh, there you go. That is the end of 1154 feet. That is an okay score. That is <laughs> supremely okay. Good job, everyone. Thanks for playing. <laughs> All right, Abe, thanks so much for that. Absolutely, anytime. So we're actually going to play another round, so uh, bye. Hello, everyone. Hiya. How is it going? Oh, OK. So, so this session is going to be a little bit different, right? Yeah, but we, we should actually introduce ourselves. Um, I'm Paul. He's Jake. Uh, we work in uh, DevRel. Yes. Now, we've been doing web stuff for a while. And it still manages to surprise us. So we've written a quiz that explores the weird and wonderful corners of the yeah. web. But we're also going to dig into the answers and hopefully explain parts of the web, web platform in a way that will help you with your projects and let you build faster, more reliable, progressive web apps. And of course, the quiz itself is a PWA. So prepare yourselves. Get your smartphones, tablets, or laptops at the ready, because we're going to play the Big Web Quiz. Paul did spend three hours making that one intro in After Effects, by the way. So. It's more like six, but whatever. <laughs> Worth every minute. So if you want to play along, and you should, because it's basically the whole point of this session, get yourself down to bigwebquiz.com uh, and log in with your Google accounts. And of course, this is the part where we panic about the server falling down. Uh, it's OK, though. We did test it at Chrome Dev Summit. Yes, and the server fell down. Yes, it did. But I, I think we fixed that. Uh, and with a little bit of luck, it, it should be OK. Yeah, it, it should. But should then fine. your laptop screwed up on this stage last year. Last year, year my laptop broke. But that's a new laptop now. In fact, it's the so, first time I've ever presented yeah. from it. So, so an, it's probably an untested laptop is what you're telling probably me. Probably going to be fine. Uh, is everyone being able to get logged in? Is that sort of thing working? Thumbs yes, up. thumbs up. Oh, we're winning yes. from Chrome Dev Summit. That's just so Sorry, that's I so mean, good. obviously. Yeah, last time we did it, people were just shaking their heads. And we were like, oh, what do we do now? We just panic. Just have, oh, a, have a blind panic. OK. Anyway, we're going to show the top players at the end of the game and at some points throughout, but we only want to do that with your permission. Mm. So if you want to appear on the leaderboard, click on your avatar and click 
appear on leaderboard. Yeah, so if you phoned in sick so you could come here instead, yeah, don't opt in because your massive face appearing on this screen might give things away a little bit, you know. Oh, of course, no quiz is complete without a grand prize. Yes. Oh. Unfortunately, unfortunately, the organizers of Google I.O. told us we weren't allowed to give, have our own giveaway, but we came up with a compromise. Yeah, we said, what if, what if our prize was of such low quality that winning it would kind of feel like losing? <laughs> yes. I mean, if you play the big web quiz, opt into the leaderboard, and use your esoteric web knowledge to make it into the top three, you will become the proud owner of the official big web quiz mouse pad. Oh. oh, yeah. I think we all know he's enjoying that. Uh, uh, we've been asked to make it clear uh, you only get the mouse pad. Paul Irish is sold separately. So um, if you are watching this on uh, the live stream, hello. Um, but yeah, and feel free to play along as well. You, you can't win uh, the mouse pad, unfortunately. Um, yeah. And there's, there's, a, there's a delay, right? There is. The, the live stream. Yeah, about 30 seconds behind reality. So uh, you're going to need to watch for the questions appearing on your device, um, as the question may end before the video makes its way to you. Yeah, so in fact, if you're watching this on the live stream now, we've probably started the first question already, uh, because we're going to be doing that in 30 seconds. And you are living in the future right now. Ooh. At Paul, this is hurting my head. Yeah, we don't take much to confuse you, really. So. No, no, Should we do a practice true. question, make sure everything's working? Yes. Let's see if this works. Let's give it a go. So devices at the ready. Here comes the first question. What does PWA stand for? Is it progressive web app produced with Angular, partially wheeled automobile, or perfectly waterproofed anorak? Now, there, there, does anorak, is that a word that's, it's a, it's a coat. It's a coat. It yeah, obviously makes right it the right coat. answer. Yeah. Uh, the question should, uh, if everything's working, be appearing on your phones now. So pick the answer that you think is correct and hit Submit. Very important that you hit Submit. And while you're doing that, let's see how the results are looking. So what we're seeing here is the percentage of you picking each answer. However, uh, so the, the, the order is randomized depend, you know, compared to your devices. It may not be in the same order. Yes, but we can see that you're all converging on one particular answer. Wonder which one that might be. Who uh, Should we close the question? We're closing the question in three, two, one. And there it is. There it is. Oh, okay. So some well, of you think it's are. produced with Angular. That's interesting. Okay. Yeah, perfectly waterproof anorak. Obviously, somebody hasn't really thought about it. Okay. Been to a session yet? Uh, the correct answer is, of course, progressive web app. Yes. Uh, so we didn't award points for that question uh, since it's, you know, it's just for a bit of a practice. Uh, but one thing we do want to stress is that you have to hit that submit button once you've picked your answer, else we don't find out about it. Yeah, it turned out that during the rehearsal, some of our colleagues didn't realize that, and they scored zero points. Yes. And in true web fashion, like rather than fix the problem properly, we thought we'd just sort of gaffer tape over it with this slide and just tell you, just make sure you press that yeah, button. Just read the the instructions. So. Hmm. Um, so everybody knows what they're doing. So we're gonna, let's get serious now, I think. Yes. From now on, each question will award a maximum of four points. Yes, yeah. indeed. That's a nice, nice round number, number, isn't it? A power yeah. of two. Very happy yeah. with that. Right, OK, so we're going to kick everything off with a deep dive into loading stuff. Because if you want to build a successful progressive web app, you need to minimize the time from the user clicking a link uh, and then actually having your app on the screen and being able to use it. Yeah, now this is the difference between a fast app and a slow app, of course. Mm, yes, so ideally, a progressive web app should load bit by bit. Some might say progressively. Mm. However, some loading techniques get in the way of parsing and painting, and that can result in the browser like downloading loads of stuff, but being unable to show any of it to the user. And then once everything's downloaded, ta-da, there's this big reveal. Absolutely. Right? And that's bad for the user, because they're left staring at a white screen, um, wondering if stuff's downloading, whether their connection is hung. Uh, whereas a progressive render improves the perception of performance, because things can start appearing much sooner. Yeah, and internally, this is good as well, because the browser can create these elements as the HTML downloads, which is much faster than doing like, all of the download as one step, than doing all of the parsing as a completely separate step. And that brings us to our next question. Yeah. So devices at the ready. Here it comes. Which of the following script elements blocks the parser while the script downloads? So we have a, a normal script tag there. Uh, we've got a script with defer, a script with async, 
uh, and a script of async equals false. Now, this is a little different to the last one because you can select all answers that you think are true. Mm. And you're going to get points for the answers that you select that turn out to be true and points for not selecting the ones that are false. Yeah, it's actually simpler than it sounds, honest. You, you get four points for getting it fully right. You get two points if you get it half right. Yeah, and it might be all of them. Might be none of them. Might be somewhere in the middle. Mm. Also, you can submit as many times as you want. Uh, so if you change your mind at the last second, you can do that. Just make sure you hit the submit button. Okay, let's look at the voting. Don't worry, you'll get faster than this. Let's see how things are going. Ooh. Okay, so already we've got a kind of spread of answers. We've got two that you're pretty confident on, two that you're less confident on. You've had enough time to guess, so if you haven't guessed already, guess. But we're going to lock the question. Close Three, it. two, one, lock it. Okay, so what we're seeing here, we're thinking a normal script element blocks the parser, and we're also thinking that async equals false one is going to do the same. Interesting. The correct answer? It's just that one, just the normal script. There's some happy people. There's some less happy people. <laughs> so yes, although it was just a, a multi-select, it was only, only one of them that was actually correct. Uh, scripts are awful by default. They block parsing while they download and execute. Uh, deferred and async scripts, on the other hand, they do not block the parser while they download. Uh, the difference between the two is when they execute. Deferred scripts execute once parsing is complete, and they always execute in the order that the HTML parser discovers them. Async scripts, on the other hand, they execute as soon as they download, and that means they can run in a different order. And you may have noticed async equals false was in the list of options for that last question. Yeah, it doesn't do anything. The browser ignores the attribute value completely. Yeah, so what we're basically saying is async equals false is true, which I absolutely adore. Yes, well done, web. That is true. Uh, and that's true of most HTML stuff, like Boolean attributes, uh, they're either there or they're not. Uh, the exception is ARIA, where you can actually set things to be false. True story. Uh, so let's talk about which one of these that, you know, when to use the, the right one, which one is best. OK. So having the scripts execute in any order is probably risky, because if you've got, say, five async scripts, you've got 120 different permutations of execution order. Mm. And so if your scripts rely on one another, uh, you, you, one of them causes failure, then you don't know where you're at. That's a tricky bug to reproduce and to solve. Yeah, deferred scripts are, are better in this regard because they run at a predictable time and in a predictable order. But if you've got this kind of like a really long article and your script is to enhance a button that's at the very top of the page, it's a big waste of time to be waiting for the whole page to download just to enhance that little button at the top there. Absolutely. So JavaScript execution is always going to block the parser uh, and other JavaScript. So yep. async scripts could actually cause junk during your page load if they're big or complex and they just arrive during the middle of your page load. So, so the answer really is it, it depends. Yeah, really, it depends. Uh, test it and do whatever gives the best user experience. For Turns out users. tools, not rules, is probably a, a good guiding principle here. Tools, not rules. Oh, we should have said, um, at the end of this session, bigwebquiz.com will show a set of links to resources and uh, documentation for the things that we've been talking about uh, in case you don't believe us or you want to learn more about a particular area. Yeah, uh, OK, so we've been discussing these scripts here, but they're kind of, they're old. They've been around for years. Uh, but there is a new way to load JavaScript. Yes. Ooh. Scripts can be loaded as ECMAScript modules, and it's this type equals module thing that, that makes it a bit different. Uh, module scripts can be external resources using the source attribute like this, or they can be inline, like normal scripts. Mm. Uh, the exciting thing you can do with modules is use these import statements to dynamically load scripts. Uh, and this is actually supported in Safari in the, the stable version right now. Uh, but it's also behind a flag in Chrome, Firefox, and Edge. But once it load, lands in all the browsers, I think it's definitely the best way to load scripts. Yeah, it seems it's good. really cool. So on that note, here comes a really cruel question. Devices at the ready. Here we go. According to the specification, which of the following scripts executes first? That's and a good you quiz got, voice. Thank you. I've been practicing it backstage in my hotel room. It's been very awkward. So um, what have we got here? So we've got type equals module. Type equals module with something in line. Defer with something in line. And then uh, standard issue script there, but with defer on it as well. Mm, which one executes first? Let's see what you're saying so far. OK, so it's kind of, there's a bit of a debate there's around a, two of the answers. What two of them, yeah. Two of them. Yeah, it's yeah. Standard, but it's fairly. Yeah, it's if a, you haven't guessed already, get a guess in. There's no harm in guessing, because we are going to close the question. Three, Three two, one. one. And it's closed. There so we what go. we're saying here, some people think script one is going to execute first, which makes sense in terms of numbers. It, it's the first number. I like that. Um, that's, that's probably how we actually write our questions. Some people thinking script two, which isn't the first number. No, there you okay. go. Thank you for yeah. that, Jake. The, the answer, though, it is script, script three. three. Oh, oh, yes. Someone is very happy at the front there. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> OK, here's why that is. Uh, like I said before, the way scripts block execution by default while they download, that was a bad design, a real design mistake. So module scripts uh, have a different default. They are deferred. But the same also goes for inline module scripts. Yeah. And this is actually pretty new, because regular inline scripts cannot be deferred. So in this case, the attribute is totally ignored, making it just a normal script, which executes immediately. So it's first. Uh, you can also use async as well on module scripts. And this causes it to execute as soon as all of its imports have downloaded. Now, fetching stuff from the network quickly is important. But not having to fetch it at all is even better. So we're going to take ourselves a dive into some caching stuff. Mm. And there are two basic types of cache usage that we're interested in here. When the page fetches something, it's going to start by looking for a match in the HTTP cache. Sometimes the thing it finds needs validating with a server. So it makes a connection and says, hey, I've got this thing already. It's this old, and it's this shaped. Uh, and the server can either say, no, 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 don't use that. Uh, here's a newer version. Or it sends back a tiny message saying, yeah, you're good to use what you've got. Now, if that happens, the cache sends what it has back to the page. Sometimes, however, the browser makes a fetch. It finds a result in the HTTP cache. But this time, it doesn't need validating with the server. So it just goes ahead and uses it. It doesn't even ask the server at all. And that is faster, right? Especially for small assets where like, just making the request, making that connection is the majority of the work. Now, the primary way to tell the browser how it should use the cache is the cache control response header, which takes a variety of values. A variety. Mm. But do you know? what they are and what they do. Because we didn't. No, we did not. Uh, but let's find out if you do. The device is at the ready. Here comes the next question. So this one, what does, the, what does that header, what does that header as a response header tell the browser to do? Does it say, don't put this in the cache? Does it mean cache it, but you can only use it after server validation? Or does it mean cache it, and you can use it without server validation for 31,536,000 seconds, which is a year? Yeah. Yeah. So let's have a look at the voting, see how we do. Oh, hey. I love it when this happens. 50-50 on two of them. Oh. That's exciting. Some happy, some sad, some confused. It's definitely one answer people are thinking. It's definitely not. So Should we lock it in? Yes. Three, yeah, guessing if you haven't already. Two, three, three, one, three two, eight, seven, seven, eight, 42. Lock it. Lock it in. OK. <laughs> OK, so you're saying cache it, but you can, uh, you can use it after server validation, or you cache it and use it without server validation, some of you are saying. The answer, of course it is. You can use it without server validation. I don't know what made some of you think must revalidate means it must revalidate. You know, yeah. that, that would be weird. Uh, in fact, it does mean that the browser must revalidate once the max age expires. If the browser has a copy of the resource that's under that age, it can feel free to use it without checking in with the server. OK. What about this one? What does same caching header as last time, except that the no cache, uh, we're using no cache instead of must revalidate. Same, yep. same, same answers, answers, same question, just must revalidate has been replaced with no cache. OK. Yeah. Let's have a look at the voting. It's easy, right? Uh, obviously. Oh, so once again, we've got a sort of 50 50 situation between two of them. Oh, but one of them is, is winning. That's good. I'm seeing a lot of concentrating faces in the audience, which makes me very happy on the inside. Get a guess in if you haven't already. We are closing the question in three, three two, two, one. And it's closed. Right, um, OK. So we're saying uh, no cache would mean do not put this in the cache. The answer is ooh, cache it but you can only use it after yeah. server validation. I don't know what made some of you think no cache means no cache. Yeah. yeah, no cache is shorthand for must revalidate max age zero. Uh, so the additional max age we have there is, is just ignored. No cache means the browser may use the cache, but it must check with the server first. We do, no, do not know why they are named like this. It's like they had a load of features and some good names for them, and then they put them in a bag and picked them out at random. <laughs> Well, they do say the hardest problems in computer science are cache invalidation and naming things. And this happens to involve naming things to do with cache invalidation. Yeah, they were destined to fail. Destined so let's have a chat about what we should typically do here, then. Yeah, well, uh, like we said, it's best to avoid a request if possible. So for sub-resources, treat your content as immutable. Give it a unique URL that never changes, like we have here, cat 4 e 22 whatever. Uh, and let that cache for as long as you can, which is a year. Uh, so if you wanted to update this resource, you would need to change its URL. Uh, there are lots of build system tools that can help with this, one of which is, is Webpack. But you know, Rails and, and uh, Python, like Django, they all have their own. There are plenty of, stuff of them. But not all of your content is going to be immutable. For example, a page like About Us, or pretty much anything that the user is going to visit directly. Uh, in this case, it's usually best to use no cache. 
And that means that the browser will always check in with the server first. However, the page contains like really private data. You can tell the browser not to store it at all using no store, which is actually named quite well. Yeah, it kind of came out of the bag at the right time. Oh, so no just, store. Let's just look, store I guess. It. Uh, although, if you've given like, an untrustworthy person or piece of software the access they need to read your browser cache, then you, know, you kind of have bigger problems. You know, some people will say it's just paranoia doing a, a yeah. no-store. But there is another caching pattern that we do see quite a lot around the web, mm. and it does lead to some pretty weird behaviors. Uh, because some sites want, want the benefit of avoiding going to the network, uh, but they haven't set up their build system to generate unique URLs. So they go with regular URLs like script.js. Uh, and they expect the content to change over time, meaning they don't want to cache it for a year, but they take a guess. And they kind of go, oh, how does, how does a couple of hours sound? Two hours. Sounds yeah. like a good compromise. But it really isn't. It's a really bad compromise. And we see this everywhere like on a lot of static services as well. Don't do this. Uh, here's why. Let's say you're serving some HTML, CSS, and, and JavaScript, and you're telling it to cache for two hours. User visits your site, and that means they, they download a lot, right? And they end up with those resources in their cache and on their page. So yeah, so, so far. So far, so good. Yeah, it's all working. But let's say an hour later, you update your HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So they're version 2 now. Uh, but you don't change the URLs. Meanwhile, user's browsing around the web. And the browser just decides, eh, I've had enough of those two. And it's going to remove the HTML and the JavaScript from the cache. And maybe you're thinking, well, why would the browser ever do that? But the browser can remove whatever it wants from the cache whenever it wants to. Maybe it just wanted some space back. Yeah, and also, uh, because these assets have a max age, and that's from the point they're downloaded, you can get them out of sync. They can expire at, at different points. Uh, so now the user returns to the site. Uh, they'll get the CSS from the cache, because it's still within the two hours. Uh, but the other assets, they are going to come from the network. Yeah, so now you've got version 2 of your HTML and your JavaScript, but you're still on version 1 of your CSS. Yeah, and the result of that, uh, it, could, it could be fine. You could get away with it, maybe. Or you could end up with a load of broken, unstyled stuff appearing Basically, on the page. Basically, it's a big gamble. And it's going to be very, very hard to figure out why if it breaks. So don't do that if you can avoid it. Instead, either use no cache or immutable resources with a year of caching. So, so far, we've covered piles of blocking and caching, but another part of page load is timing. Now, some resources start downloading pretty late, and the performance can suffer as a result. The most common one that we see is web fonts, I would say. Yeah. And fonts are defined in your CSS, including how to download them and where to use them. So once the browser has downloaded your CSS, it performs a recalc to apply all those styles to the page. And at this point, it discovers that it needs a web font for one or more of those paragraphs on your page. So it begins fetching it. Meanwhile, the browser lays out the page and paints it. But this paint is going to be missing the text that mm. needs the web font. Oh, yeah, we've all seen this. Mm. And we've all sat there going, really? Really, really? I just wanted to read it. <laughs> um, and it's pretty frustrating, right? But once the, uh, the font has downloaded, the browser performs layout again and paints the page, this time with the text using the web font. Yeah, so as you can tell, this isn't really optimal. You know, the font starts downloading so late, and the result of it is the user is left without content. Well, they, they actually have the content on their device. It's just it's the browser is refusing to download it, absolutely. Uh, refusing to paint Show it. Me, right? yeah. Yeah, now, you can improve things a lot using uh, link rel preload. And with this in the head of your document, you're telling the browser that you need the resource as part of loading the page. So that means the download can happen in parallel Ooh, with the CSS. Right, so now you can see here the time between the CSS download and the font download is massively reduced, and that means the user gets content quicker. Which is now, great. when you use link rel preload, uh, the response is actually stored in a special preload cache hmm, until the browser needs it. So, yeah, we've got this preload cache, we've got the HTTP cache, but there is another. Uh, in HTTP2, the browser can like, ask the server for something, and the server can say, yeah, sure, here it is, but also, Here's some other stuff that I think you might need. It sends, this is called HTTP2 push. The server sends down an additional response and the information the browser needs to know for when it can use those responses. Thing is, this cache, they end up, it's a completely different cache from the other two. Which brings us to our next question. Devices at the ready. Which cache does the browser check first? Is it the HTTP2 push cache, the preload cache, or the HTTP cache? This is a cruel one. It's not one I knew until talking to the networking <laughs> team at Chrome. I think, I think this is bearing out what we're seeing here, which is. Yeah. Well, there's one answer people are kind oh, of yeah, actually, than the others. Oh, there's getting less shit. Now you now. see, there's okay. confidence is waning, Jake. Oh, it's going. OK. Definitely take a guess if you haven't already. Make sure you hit that submit button. We're going to close it. The question. Three, two, one. one. It's closed. Round. Oh, the ACB cache was winning that one. Popular answer. Popular answer among Googlers, I, I seem to remember when we did rehearsal. And just like the Googlers, 
Wrong. Wrong. <laughs> the correct answer is it's link the preload, preload cache. Absolutely. Uh, as you can see, some of these questions are deliberately obscure, so really do not feel bad if you're getting them wrong. Like we said, like Un your unless Googler's you're a Googler who's in one of our rehearsals, in which case you should feel bad. All those Googlers bad. were fired, by the way, so they don't work here anymore. Uh, it, in fact, if you do end up with a top score, it probably means you didn't learn a lot from this talk, so you've kind of wasted your time being here, to be honest. Unless you say. win the mouse pad. Unless you win the mouse pad. That's a desirable prize. I'm glad they didn't applaud that, because that would have been good. Yes. So yeah, free cash is in play here, and it, it is pretty complicated, but knowing this stuff can help prevent a loads of kind of weird edge casey bugs. So when your page contains a preload element, the browser fetches it as normal through the HTTP cache, potentially to the server, and it ends up in this memory cache that sits alongside the page. So the things to note from this is that your preloaded stuff may come from the HTTP cache, but also since the preload cache sits with the page, uh, other pages will not use it. Uh, they may have their own preload caches, but one page won't use another page's preload cache. Yeah, so that means it's pointless to use link rel preload to try and preload things for another page, uh, maybe the next page, because that page is going to have its own uh, preload cache. The HTTP2 cache, on the other hand, it sits with the connection. Uh, and that makes it pretty different to preload, uh, because two pages can share an HTTP connection, so they can share the same push cache. Uh, things you push intended for one page may end up being consumed by another. Yeah, that's pretty complicated, isn't it? And also, because the server initiates the push, you could be pushing something the user already has in their cache. Uh, the spec does say that browsers can send a message to the server saying, no, stop that. I've already got it. But no browser does this yet. So the answer to the actual question, the question that we asked, the browser checks the preload cache first, then the HTTP cache, and then the push cache. Yes. Yes, that's it. Yeah, that's it. So like you said, it is a good thing to keep in mind. It is a bit out there. But at the same time, uh, if you do find you've got, you've got weird behaviors, then it's good to know um, where to start looking. Mm. Yeah, I think HTTP2 push is dead powerful, but it's pretty low level. And in many cases, link roll preload is a simpler, more reliable solution. Uh, and it definitely seems to catch people out less. And dev tools are much more helpful when things are going wrong. Absolutely. So that's the networking round, if you like, complete. Should we take a look at our leaderboard? Yes, we shall. Let's see how you're doing. Mm. Ooh. Ooh. Oh, ho, ho, ho. Oi. There we are. Have one person in the lead place. at the moment. Andre in first with 20 points. That's pretty good. But we're only halfway through. Well, Absolutely. Less than halfway, so if you've been playing this quiz and you're competing with colleagues and you're thinking, well, they know plenty of network stuff, you know, they've got an unfair advantage, well, hold on. Because the thing is, CSS and rendering, that might be your thing. And that's your time to shine. Mm. Because indeed. Let's talk a little bit about rendering. Yeah, animations are important in uh, communicating parts of your UI to the user. And they also just look really cool. We've yeah. had a lot of fun with animations so far here, right? Uh, but a badly performing animation uh, can be really jarring, often worse than no animation at all. Yeah, now modern browsers have an animation fast path known as compositing. And this means that the browser takes a particular element and it temporarily isolates it into its own layer. Now, if the conditions are correct, the browser does this automatically for an animation. And this minimizes, minimizes the impact of the animation as the browser doesn't have to keep repainting uh, the thing behind the element that's actually doing the animation. And at the end of the animation, it can merge down or flatten uh, that content back with the other content on the page. Mm. But as Paul said, the conditions need to be correct for this to happen. <laughs> so devices at the ready, here comes a question. We're animating a circle in an SVG. Which of the following animations will be automatically composited in Chrome 57? So it's the center x, center x and transform, transform, or opacity. And you can select, I believe, all that apply. I need to get in on the You do. I think I like, I, I like your quiz voice. I'll give it a go on the next question. All right, go on. How are you voting now? OK, so Ooh. strong feelings about kind of three of them, less confident with one of them. Ooh, get a guess in if you haven't already. We're going to close the question in three, three two, two, one. Don't forget to submit. There and you it's go. Closed. OK, so we're sort of saying uh, we've got a transform there. So yeah, yeah the right. opacity and transform. Mm -hmm. The correct answer, Ooh. it's none of none them. It's <laughs> cruel, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, for implementation and legacy reasons in Chrome today, and I think it's fair to say we'd love to see this change, uh, compositing never happens for elements inside of an SVG element. Use an out-of-date emoji there, Paul. That's not on brand. Awkward. Uh, awkward. This means your animations are going to paint as a flat single layer every frame. It, uh, yeah, and in case you're wondering, uh, Edge and Firefox do currently support composited SVGs, but Safari 10.1, like Chrome, does not. But the good news is, it, is it's something that we are looking at, and we'll post a link to the Chromebug at the end of the quiz, so you'll see it in the resources uh, on your devices.
OK, so that's SVG. But let's talk about your standard issue DOM, you know, your non-SVG DOM. We are animating a div. Which of the following animations can be automatically composited in Chrome 57? Is it margin left, width and transform, transform, or opacity? Can I commend you on your quiz voice? I really like that one. Oh, it's it's based on a, a, the guy from The Weakest Link in, in, oh, in the UK. Okay. Yeah. 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 Let's take a look at the voting. Okay. Similar kind of feel to last time, I'd say this. People are holding on to their previous answers, it seems. Perhaps. But will that pay off for them? It's, it's a bold play. Yeah, should we play it? Three, two, one. And we're closing. There we are. Tricky, tricky. Okay, so we've got the width and transform, opacity and transform, the margin left less confident on. The correct answers, of course. Ooh. Pr yeah. Pretty right as a room. That, well that was a good show. Yeah, the answer good is show. any animation that transitions on opacity or transform. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and if you declare the animation up front using CSS and transitions or keyframed animations, the browser can probably move the whole thing away from the main thread. Yeah, and if that happens, the animation can continue jank-free even if the main thread is busy. Uh, however, an element that's composited and declaratively animated may still have a frame-by-frame -frame dependency on the main thread. Absolutely. Now, that correct answer of width two seconds, transform two seconds, is one of these. Now, sure, the, uh, the element is going to get its own layer if you animate transform. That is absolutely true. But if you animate width, even if you make something have its own layer, you will trigger recalc styles, layout, and paint per frame. Uh, and these are all main thread bound pieces of work. Mm. Yeah, and that's, uh, it's true that things are getting faster uh, in terms of layout and paint. Um, or at least phones are getting faster. Mm -hmm. Trying to do layout and paint per frame is not normally 60 frames a second fast uh, on a smartphone. Mm. Uh, in fact, layout is scoped to the DOM. So the bigger the document you have, it, the longer it tends to take yeah, in most that's, situations. That's not the kind of thing you typically want from an animation. Mm. So. So the most performance solution here is to stick to transforms and opacity and animate only those properties. Yeah, so just because uh, an element has its own layer doesn't mean that it's safe to start animating properties like left or margin or something like that. OK, let's switch this up a little bit. Let's, let's switch to some event-based animations. Let's get oh. some JavaScript in there as well. Oh, Devices at the ready. Is this is your favorite? Is yeah, it? yeah, I really enjoy this one. Here comes the next question. You have an element with no transform and the following code. According to the HTML specification, what happens next? All right, talk me through the code here. What's going so you on? So we've got a click uh, on click. Um, there's a transform, which translates x200 pixels. All right. Switch on a transition on transform, and then we set the transform to 100 pixels. Does it slide to the right? Does it slide to the left? Does it do the Macarena? Or does it snap to 100 pixels? Let's see how people are voting. Oh, we've got some strong opinions. There's one answer there that people. Well, what's interesting here is there's two answers that are unpopular, and I thought one would have been significantly less popular than any of them. <laughs> Turns out not. Yeah. Uh, okay. Get a guess in if you haven't already. Hit submit. We are closing the question in three, two, one. How are you feeling? It's in. Interesting. Some so people do think it does the macarena. Snapping I and right. I don't 30, know. That's 13%. That's a lot of people I, who have clearly just given up on the quiz. I don't know. Fair I enough. don't know what to say, folks. Do, uh, put it this way, one of the highest scores we got when we did this in rehearsal was our design advocate, and he was just like, oh, I'm just, I'm just, just picking guessing. random guesses, guessing. and he got one of the top know. scores. I don't even so know anymore. It's pretty good. The correct answer, of course, when it appears on the screen, it slides to the right. Now, Paul, I did maths at school, and I was led to believe that 200 is a bigger number than 100. Therefore, moving from 200 to 100 would be to the left. And while I agree with you, you did just say maths. And I think here it would probably be math. I, I don't know. I don't know. I th it's mathematics, so the abbreviation is, is maths, I, I, is my strong opinion. But you know what, America, I could live with it. I could live with it. But then you took that S that you saved, and you put it on the end of Lego. Ooh, Legos. The toy is Lego. Legos is an island off the coast of Spain, probably. I don't know. I'm not a geographist. Shall we? Oh, we should, let's move on before we trigger an international <laughs> the incident. Ruth doesn't like that. No. <laughs> OK. Oh, so why does it slide to the right, then? What's going on? It's because browsers try and reduce their workload. And the HTML spec uh, accounts for this by saying that a task is queued to run event callbacks. And at the end of the current task, the rendering pass begins. And this is where the browser takes stock of any style changes. Now, by, by that point, that translate x 200 pixels has been overwritten by the translate x 100 pixels. So as far as the browser is concerned, the animation should be from no transform at all 
to 100 pixels. Mm. And that means when the frame is shipped, it's going to slide to the right. So although the, the DOM layer sees uh, set the transform to 200 pixels, uh, we overwrite that value before the style system in the browser like, takes any note of it. Right? Yeah, exactly. So what we need to do, if we wanted to slide from the right to the left, is to make sure that 200 pixel transform kind of takes hold before we overwrite it to 100 pixels. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, here comes the next question. You have an element with no transform in the following. It's the same question, really. Same question, but yes. the difference is we have that final transform wrapped inside a request animation frame. Does it slide to the right? Does it slide to the left? Does it snap to 100 pixels? Or does it gain sentience and feel only sadness? Basically, a web developer. Let's see how you are voting. Or less sure this time, dividing the room. Uh, except for one particular answer, I wonder which one that is. Mm. Get a guess in if you haven't already. We are closing the question. Three, two, one. It's locked in. Oh, so what are we seeing here? Oh, kind of pretty much equal guessing among the. That tends to happen with this quiz about this point. People just kind of, it all just spreads out evenly among the uh, non ridiculous answers, should we say. <laughs> the correct answer, though, is once again. It slides to the right. What? Ta da! What? Yes. Why? Yes. Tell me. Because uh, maybe you're thinking Why? that. OK, Carl. Because we, <laughs> you set the transform to 200 pixels, and you maybe thought, hey, we waited a frame, and then we set it to 100 pixels. So surely it took hold. You know, we got the 200 pixels to take hold, and then we animated. Like, that's what you'd expect. But no, the HTML spec says, once again, uh, things should be a little bit different to that. Yeah, it's the same as before. Our event callback runs as part of a task. Uh, and then we get to the rendering bits of the event loop. And that involves running any requested animation callbacks. And then the browser thinks about styles and such and doing the actual painting. Uh, because animation callbacks happen before style recalculation, the net result is exactly the same before. right? Like we, we overwrite the value before the style system sees it. OK, so let's talk about what we could do then if we wanted to solve this. Now, one fix that we could apply here would be to not call request animation frame once, oh no, but in fact call it twice. Just take that in, enjoy that. <laughs> now, if you request an animation callback while the browser is running an animation callback, then those will run in the next turn around the event loop mm. uh, after style recalc, which would mean that you've definitely got something at 200 pixels uh, before transforming it to 100 pixels. The downside here is that you've got ridiculous looking code and that it would be an extra frame before the animation starts. And in fact, in Safari, you'd actually wait uh, two frames, because they don't follow the spec, though they do follow what I think was our expectation. Yeah, initially, we thought Chrome was buggy yes. in this case until we, were we actually looked at the spec. I was like, mm. CR bug and everything. Ready. And then, <laughs> oh, no. Uh, but perhaps you don't want to do this kind of ridiculous double raft thing. And instead, you want to force that style recalculation to happen synchronously so the style system sees that 200 pixel transform before you change it to 100 pixels. Shall we have a question on that? Yes. Here we go. What could go in here? And by here, we mean where it says answer goes here. Um, to force a synchronous update in Chrome 57. Get bounding client rect. Offset width. Get computed style in a text. Select all that apply. Ah, multi-select one. Let's see how people are voting. OK, so we're confident on one of them, unsure about two of them. Pretty certain one of them isn't. Seems to be what the room is saying okay. so far, though it's kind of rising. We are going to close the question in a couple of seconds. So take a guess if you haven't already. Make sure you hit the Submit button. Closed in three, two, one. And it's done. Get computer oh. style there being the most popular of all the answers. Interesting. Yeah, but offset the with? correct answer, mm. Mm. what is it? It is, it is. everything oh. but get computed style. <laughs> Who knew? We didn't. Well, I didn't. You did. Here's why. So the browser starts off knowing the styles and layout for every element. Uh, and you know, because it needed to know all of that stuff in order to, to draw what you saw the, the frame before. Uh, but then we set translate x to 200 pixels, meaning the browser's calculations are, are no longer valid, no longer up to date. And that isn't a problem, because the browser will just like recompute everything uh, once it needs to update the actual rendering. However, if we call get bounding client rect offset width or inner text, the browser has to recalculate the style and the layout synchronously in order to give you the correct answer. Yeah, so if you're asking for, say, the width of an element, the browser has to figure out what you changed, what the impact of that change is, and then and only then can it give you the answer. Mm, right, and, and, you know, and all of the correct answers cause that to happen. The, probably the most surprising one is inner text. Uh, because like, an inner text actually has a, a layout dependency, because it will, won't give you the text of the inner elements that are displaying none. And it also has some dependencies on, on line layout as well. 
The problem here is mostly that these are all fairly heavyweight options. Mm. Uh, they trigger both style calculations and layout synchronously, not per frame like in the previous example, mm -hmm. admittedly. Yeah, and since layout calculations, they scale with the DOM size, that you risk pushing the start of your animation back, uh, which may make your app feel laggy. You press a button, you have yeah. to wait a few milliseconds before it, it starts up. Now, what we'd probably like to do is avoid calculating layout, if at all possible, uh, which we can do with Get Computed Style. And you might have noticed that that wasn't one of the correct answers. Uh, and that's because things are ever so slightly nuanced here. Mm. Because you might think Get Computed Style captures the styles. But no. When it's called, you might think that, but not. In fact, it's not. No, because if you update the styles before checking a property of the computed styles object, you'll get the second value and not the first. And this blew my mind when you first showed me it late. The styles aren't computed when you call the big get computed styles function. No, they are computed when you access one of the properties of the object it returns. So to work around this weirdness, you call get computed style, but also access one of the properties, such as, as transform. And in the question, technically, we didn't actually access the transform property. So we wouldn't do, do anything. Uh, all that said, we overlooked one option, which is uh, using web animations. And this is a nice imperative API, quite kind of jQuery-like. Uh, it'll do these kind of animations, and it'll make use of compositing and everything. Uh, the problem is web animations, not great support out there. It's basically just partial support in Chrome and Firefox. Uh, and because it's in Chrome, it means you get it in like Opera and Samsung Internet, et cetera, but not in Edge or Safari. Yeah, so while it is an option for Compact, you're probably going to use Get Computed Style uh, for the time being. OK, so with both network and rendering people, hopefully fairly happy, but it isn't over yet. Oh, no. Let's bring on the quick fire round. By which we mean the silly questions that didn't really fit into the narrative of the talk anyway. Pretty much. So, it's so just we just want to ask back. them. OK, so our first one of these. Ready? Let's go. When we say quick file, we mean quick. Yeah, what yeah. happens with foo, min height, 300 pixels, max height, 200 pixels? Uh, will it be 200 pixels tall? Will it be 300 pixels tall? Will it be zero pixels tall? Will it crash all browsers in a three mile radius? Get an answer in quickly. Three. Well, let's see how people are voting. So we've got one answer that's particularly popular. Hit submit, take a guess, because we're closing the question in three, three two, two, one. It is called quick file for out. a reason. OK, 200 pixels tall is the most popular answer there. Now, according to the CSS spec, okay. here we go. Ding! 300 The pixels. algorithm for height is figure out the tentative height. Uh, and then if it's bigger than max height, reduce it. And if it's smaller than min height, grow it. I have literally no idea what you just said. Fair yeah, enough. I didn't think you did. Right. Uh, it basically means uh, min height always wins. OK, fair enough. Here we go. Let's move on to another quick fire question. After, oh, this is my favorite. Yeah. After running this code, which of the following is set to 1? And you can see we've got an int 8 array. Uh, and we're setting a bunch of uh, items there to 1. So the suggestion here is that possibly maybe one or more of them is not going to work. So select all that apply and get an answer in quickly. Big thanks to the V8 team who showed yeah, us this one. We didn't know anything about it. No, they were um, wonderful. Judging by the spread of answers there, you know nothing about it. So it's fine. We're all friends here. Yeah. That's great. But Welcome. we're locking it in in three, two, one. There we go. OK, right. so bleh, who knows? <laughs> the correct answers, though. Here they come from the server, which is getting slow. OK, there we go. Yeah. Correct answer, 0 0.9 and 1.0. Why? Yeah, the reason is, is pretty weird. Go on. So when you do this kind of thing, when you assign uh, like this with a string, uh, JavaScript needs to decide if you're assigning to a property of the object or if you're assigning to a, an index of the array. Now, numbers are treated as array index assignments, but so are strings if the string is a canonical string representation of a number. Yeah, and when I first heard that, I had no idea what and it meant. I still don't, but okay. I can follow So, along. for example, what's this about? OK, OK, yeah. Point 0.9 is not a canonical representation, because the canonical representation is not point 0.9. Yeah, this means the browser is going to treat it as a property assignment, and that works fine. Same goes for 1.0, because the canonical representation is just 1. However, 1.1 is the canonical representation of 1.1. So JS treats it as a number. And this means it tries to assign to the 1.1th item of the array, but array indexes need to be integers. So it's just silently ignored. Yeah, just why would it throw an error? Um, so the same goes for 1.2, same and kind there, of deal. Yeah. Right, same second deal. last question. So uh, we are going to move on if my clicker continues to work. There we go. That makes me happier. Devices at the ready, here we go. How many elements are created? 
Ah, oh, okay, and so we're done. signing to inner HTML, then plus equals, plus equals, plus equals. How many elements does it create? One, four, ten, or sixteen. Let's Who see how they're knows? voting. Quick fire, so get your answers in quickly. We've got Ooh. two strong answers and two people are, you know, pretty dismissive of. Guess, if you haven't guessed already, we are closing in three, two, one, and we are closed. So we're saying four and one, the most popular answers of the room. Okay. The correct answer, of course, is 10. Ten. Hey! Yay! So why is this then? Okay, so when you use plus equals, it is equivalent. It's just shorthand for reading the value and adding more to it. It's a read and a write. So if we expand this out further, we create one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten elements. There you go. So there you go. If you really want to append a string to an element, you can use insert adjacent HTML, which is ancient and apparently brilliant. I get bounding client rec. Same it, kind of thing. Thank you, Internet Explorer 4, for that API. Yeah, this will actually create four elements. So we're going to do the final question of the whole quiz now. Device this might be my favorite, this one. Oh, Given this chunk of HTML, which resources are requested? So what have we got here? We've got, a, we've got a, an, an image of a source. Excellent. We've got a script of a source. A oh, link roll style links. sheet. Link roll preload. OK. Whoa. So one, it's two, a select three. many, so select all that you think apply. Yep. One, two, three, or four. Ah. Let's see how the answers are coming in. Interesting. Oh. A real spread here. So it's kind of confident, I guess. Wow. Oh. Did anyone else see that? I think that we, there is a large amount of bird mess has just landed right in front of us. That is incredible. The birds are not happy with the quiz. Yeah, yeah. Someone didn't pick the right answer in the last round. Fair enough. <laughs> okay, we are gonna. I'm gonna start back a little bit. Yeah, and we are going to close the question in three, two, one. There it goes. Okay, right. so a sort of spread, spread there of the answers. <laughs> Ooh, but which ones actually I are going this. to be requested? So good. It and is one, just one. And this question is really evil, and I don't know how many people might have, have spotted what was going on here. Yeah, so even though this is an IMAGE image, the browser does treat it as an IMG image. So yes, that one's going to download. Uh, this script uses source, S-O-U-R-C-E, rather than uh, SRC. So the browser just ignores it. Just ignores it. Doesn't download. Don't like that one. These use the correct attributes, but have you noticed that Oh, yeah, that uh, code highlight has, well, it's basically all but gone. Yeah, Pretty why changed. has it changed? Well, in HTML, script elements cannot be self-closing. That doesn't work. You have to close scripts with a proper closing <laughs> script tag. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so the browser parses those two link elements as JavaScript, and that's going to throw an error. They definitely don't download. Sorry, that was horrible. Sorry, not sorry. Completely not sorry. <laughs> Well, so this is it, uh, the moment we have been waiting almost 45 minutes for. Yeah. Who are the winners of the mouse pad? Let's find out. Oh, Ivan. Oh, Andre. And we're out in front. Andrew Betts. Andrew Betts. Congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah, excellent. But all three of you have won mouse pads. A big round of applause to our three winners. Um, so after the session, come and find us. Uh, come to the front uh, with your phone and prove that you did actually get that score. Yes, and bigwebquiz.com now shows a set of links uh, describing the detail behind some of the questions that we've asked today. And with that, we, I've, it's been a pleasure. It's yeah. been a blast. Uh, thank you so much for playing along. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, with NPR One, we are reimagining what a listening experience could be outside of the radio. It's the radio, but better. It has all of the great stuff that we've spent 40 years perfecting. With NPR One, we see the opportunity of reaching a more diverse audience that have a device in their pocket at all times. My name is Mike Saifalahi. I'm the lead mobile developer for NPR Digital Media. My name is Nick Dupre, and I'm the innovation accountant at NPR. My name is Tejas Mystery, and I'm the Senior Product Manager of NPR One. 
So some of the biggest challenges in any mobile app are that first impression. When the user first installs the app, you've got a very limited amount of time to convince them to keep the app and to get engaged in the experience. Trying to figure out how we can get users into the content as quickly as possible was the real focus of integrating Firebase and Dynamic Links. Using Dynamic Links, we were able to shorten the number of interactions it takes for a user installing the app to get from the promoted content to the content from 20 to 3. So that user is able to get right into the content. We're driving more and more listening per user every week. It's really astounding. Creating playlists of content that are configured by the podcaster or by a member station or by us internally. And with Firebase, we have that at our hands. Having the analytics product interact with things like dynamic links, remote configuration, cloud messaging, it adds a real multiplier effect. And the integration with the broader Firebase suite, I don't have to go outside the platform to figure out what's working. So it's not just about shipping the product faster, it's about analyzing the results faster. And with the integration with all the other Firebase products, we're really excited about all the things we can learn from it. Raise Labs is a company that is focused on building excellence in software, technology, and design. We do that through our work on mobile applications and websites and technologies in general. My name is Gregory Reyes. I'm the CEO and founder of Raise Labs. We really want to understand the human problem, and oftentimes the hard problems in software aren't just the technology problems, the API, the how do you connect these things, but really getting at the heart of what people are trying to accomplish and do in their day to day. My name is Ben Johnson. I'm the managing director at Raise Labs in Boston. We decided to put our hat in the ring for the Google Certified Agency Program. The first leg is just having access to a lot of what Google is doing today. So there's uh, access to design reviews, invitations to events, and that's sort of the base level. And I think that's hugely rewarding even in and of itself. Having Google review your app from a design perspective is amazingly helpful. So that's sort of the first tier. The second tier comes with certified status. Uh, you know, there's a long application process for that. And once you have it, it's something that you can really say to your clients uh, that gives them comfort that we're a reputable firm, that we're building great software in a way that Google believes in. The certification is a higher bar for us to really differentiate ourselves from many of the other companies out there. It required us to really dig into what that means to be truly world class. And we wanted to set that bar for ourselves as well. My name is John Green. I'm a VP Creative at Raise Labs. The Google Developer Agency program allowed us to have access to uh, engineers for the map team, the design team to figure out, oh, how can we actually do some of these things? And we could reach out to them when we needed. And also it allowed us to set up and say, we can make this a success. They might look closer at this app because we're part of this program, which has actually been uh, super helpful. Some of the challenges in building the Six Flags app, and which touched on some of these, are certainly mapping technology and payment technology, material design, or the APIs. Uh, having access to the Google team to really ascertain how we're approaching certain software and ensuring that we're building technologies the right way makes for a smooth development process. We set off to build the Six Flags app with a pretty lofty ambition, and it was to bring in-park navigation and commerce to the app. The comfort of knowing that Google is there to help us understand where they are heading as an organization and that we are along for that ride is a really uh, helpful thing to know. And as a business, we know that uh, going forward, we're going to be at the cutting edge of whatever Google is doing through access to programs, through uh, you know, the collaboration with their teams. It's really helpful for us to know that six months, nine months down the road, we'll still be a part of that uh, process and we'll still be working with them to figure out what's next.
to be. How's it going? It's going great. This is Brad Abrams. Brad is a product manager on Assistant. That's right. Yep. How's it going, Timothy? It's going great. Um, now that you're here and I'm here, yeah. I think we should talk about the Assistant. What do you think? I think that sounds like a great idea because it's the only thing I know to talk about, so perfect. All right, let's start with square one. Okay. What is Assistant? And why is it cool for developers? Well, the Assistant is really a conversational interface to Google. It's uh, the kind of smart brain in your Google Home or on your Android phone. And actually, at this event, we just launched it on iOS as well. Uh, and you can have really a conversation with Google to help you get things done. That's awesome. I think so. What are the different uh, surfaces for developers to integrate with? Oh, great. So assist there's a couple of different ways. One, you can extend the Assistant by adding your own custom apps to the Assistant. Um, and then you can also host the Assistant in different devices. So if you're building your own hardware or whatever, you can host your Assistant there. And that's the difference between Actions on Google and the Assistant SDK, right? Exactly. So the Assistant SDK is where you host with your hardware, and Actions on Google is extending the Assistant. Okay. Well, we're at I.O., and I know some new stuff has been announced. Why don't you oh, tell yeah. us about some of your favorites? Oh, man, it's hard to pick. There's so many. Uh, I'm really excited about Actions on Google coming to phones, to Android and iOS. So uh, up until this event, you could only build Actions on Google for home, for eyes, eyes only experience or eyes, eyes free experience. Um, and now we have Actions on Google for the phone as well. So we have suggestion chips, lists, image carousels. And it can really give you a deep multimodal experience. Oh, which you mean like seeing and hearing? That's right, you can see and hear, yeah. Uh, we also launched uh, transactions, so you can buy things via the Assistant. I think that'll help users a lot. I know I want to buy a pizza uh, on, you know, from my phone. I can just say, okay, Google, I want a pizza. And uh, it can connect me to somebody to go do that. And, it, and for developers, it also gives, uh, you know, a financial incentive, which I hear some developers like to get paid. Yes, so. indeed they do. Uh, and then, of course, deep uh, for me is developer experience. Uh, and we've done a lot of work. We launched the platform first in December, and we've done a lot of work on developer experience. So we launched a new version of the developer console. We call it the Actions Console. Uh, developers can use that to work better in teams together, to get deep analytics about their application, as well as it integrates really well with the Firebase and Google Cloud consoles. Awesome. And one, can I do one more? Absolutely. See, I can just add them. So one more uh, would be discoverability. I think that's been, in the whole kind of chatbot space generally, having people be able to discover the, them has been a problem. And so we've done a lot of work in that regard. Uh, the first is that we have a new directory for our apps, and it's right there on the assistant surface, just one tap away. And you can see a category view of all the assistant apps that are there. Uh, we also gave you a way to get a web URL into that. So if you wanted to promote your app via your enormous Twitter followers, you could totally go do that, which is awesome. And of course, people who love your assistant app can share it with their friends via the deep link. Um, and finally, we did some work to help discover when to invoke your uh, assistant app from information in the directory, other information provided by the developer. We can just respond to queries like uh, play a game and we can actually find the right uh, assistant apps to go trigger in that case. That's totally awesome. Yeah, it's really fun. It's really, it's <laughs> kind of a big release for us here at IO. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different stuff. Yes, it certainly, it certainly is. But I think it comes together in a really cohesive package though, um, because you know, if you're going to do transactions, you're going to buy things. A lot of times, having a visual surface to see the see the different options, see the cart and whatnot, really helps with that. Um, and then, of course, if you're going to have a financial interest there, being able to have people discover your assistant apps uh, really helps. Awesome. Okay, so let's take a step back, okay. and I would love to hear your thoughts just on conversational interfaces in general. Yeah, I mean, I, if you think about this evolution that's been happening, you know, like when I started using computers, it was like mouse and keyboard. It was very indirect, right? You move Wait, the... you had a mouse? I did have a mouse. <laughs> you don't think I had a mouse? Well, I mean, you know, you start with like the Commodore 128. Right, yeah, 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 okay. Before you had a keyboard and then we added a mouse. <laughs> but these are indirect, like you, you do something with your hands and something happens on the screen. And then, you know, we got capacitive touch, right? So you could actually touch the screen. And like, 
my kid when he was two knew how to touch the screen, right? Like that was very intuitive. And I think we're at the verge of making the next step. And that is rather than just being able to like touch the button, what if I could just express what I want? Why do I have to dig through a bunch of menus, find the right button to press? Not really sure what's gonna happen when I press that button. But what if I could just express my idea? This is what I want to happen. I want to play this game. I want to order this pizza. I want to do whatever. And that's what I think this conversational interface is enabling. Awesome. <laughs> um, I, I, and I do want to say that I think one of the things that's been holding us as developers back from that yes. is the right tooling to do so. You know, you know, as I describe that, I think the developers are going like, wow, sure, but how do I do that when the user, how, if you think about the huge number of ways people could say they want a pizza and order toppings on a pizza, how can they turn the huge vagaries of human language into something a developer can understand? Um, and that's where tools like API to AI can really come into play. Uh, API to AI is our own conversation building tool. And what it does is you, lets you as developers define intents just by saying, giving us some example phrases of what a user would say. And then we can do the, um, pull out the entities from that and do the natural language understanding so that we can do slot filling and actually figure out what users are saying. So you might give an example like, I want a large pepperoni pizza with tomato sauce is your example. We know it's large as a entity, pepperoni is an entity, um, and tomato sauce is an entity. We can actually pull those out and then recognize other queries like, I want a small pizza with tomatoes and green olives uh, with you know, no sauce. And, and that, uh, because we can do that, it makes it much more tractable for developers to actually understand human language. But seriously, how many times have you ordered a pizza with no sauce? Well, you know, that's pretty rare, but, you know, I actually, I'm, I'm for extra sauce, you know, just because it dribbles down your oh, face. Okay, that's, 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 that's good. Sorry, <laughs> All right, is there anything else you want to say about Assistant or any of the developer tools before we go? Uh, no, I think we pretty much covered it. All right, Brad, thanks so much. All right, thank you.